It is great to see so many attendees in the room and welcome to, our, to those that are online. This symposium is a partnership event uh, between clinical trial, the clinical trial unit from Ballarat Regional Integrated Cancer Centre and Western Victoria PHN. My name is Naomi Wives. So I'm Senior Manager of Regional Partnerships and Public Health. I'm just going to ask those that are attending in person to, to have a seat uh, and quieten down a bit for the people online to be able to hear. I'd like to be, begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the lands and waterways from which we are all zooming in from today. We recognise the diversity, resilience and the ongoing place the First Peoples hold in our communities. We pay our respects to Elders both, both past, present uh, and we wish to extend respect to any First Nations people joining us today. A little housekeeping for those that are here today. The majority of our webinar uh, events are freely available on the West Vic PHN website um, and a link to those is uh, on our website and hosted on our YouTube channel. Um, for those that are here in person, I hope you've noticed the way you came in is the way you go out um, and the toilets are through there. Thank you. Um, there should be some upcoming uh, events for us here. So Project Gecko's Population Health Network, Reproductive Health Series, Intellectual Disability Information Education, Practice Nurse and Practice Manager Meeting on the 20th of June, Cultural Awareness Training uh, in Ballarat on the 28th of June. Uh, just an uh, acknowledgement to our Health Pathway slide related to uh, information that's being presented today. Um, our links are there, our links on our website. Uh, if you are not registered for Health Pathways and you would like to be, uh, you can register through our website. Um, for those that are online, uh, please make sure you have your first and last name in the chat function. This will allow us to ensure that we can give you a certificate for today's event. If we don't know who you are, we can't send it to you. Uh, there's an evaluation for the event today. Hopefully I will have this on screen later for those that are here in uh, person and online, but please, if you'd like to grab that now, you can. Although I'm going to change the screen and make that very difficult for you. Questions uh, for the event today for those in the room, general school rules of put your hand up and I'll uh, make sure that you have an opportunity. And for those that are online, please use the Q&A function tonight so that we can make sure that your questions are considered to our presenters. Uh, I believe questions will be held over for the final, uh, after the final presenter. Uh, I'd like uh, to introduce Zoe Swain from Western Victoria Regional Training Hub for a few words. Thanks, Zoe. Thank you. All right, uh, welcome everyone and to those of you online. The Western Victoria Regional Training Hub is pleased to be able to sponsor tonight's event. Uh, for those of you in the room, are uh, going to get dinner. Uh, just a little bit about the hub and who we are. So the Western Victoria Regional Training Hub is part of a national health initiative to support rural and regional clinicians at all levels. We do this from site both here in Ballarat and in Warrnambool to cover our region. Our initiatives include a range of professional development activities. For example, we offer clinical simulations within GP clinics or within um, regional hospitals. And we also run a Dr. Jump men medical mentoring program. Uh, information about that will be put in the chat, but you'll find on the table as well a flyer. We are currently looking for mentors. So if you have um, any capacity or you're interested to support uh, and students and junior doctors into staying in rural, please consider it. Uh, there is more information on the website. We also support trainees professional development through monetary grants and rural themed conference sponsorship, as well as subsidising a range of training courses. We're working to build vocational training pathways for medical students into regional practice, and these include general practice, rural generalist, surgery, psychiatry, physician and obstetric gynecology training. This is obviously a complex and long-term plan. We're also running a promotion for those who want to sign up to our newsletter. You can go in the uh, draw to win a hamper. The link will be provided in the chat for you, those of you online, or you can have a look on the um, tables. Probably don't need that QR code up there. So, all right, and that was it. I hope you have a lovely evening. Thanks, uh, Zoe. I'm going to hand over now to Dr. Sharad Sharma. 
Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you, everyone, for coming. My name is Sharif Tama. Sorry, just a little bit higher for me, but anyway, possibly you can see me. I'm medical oncologist and head of medical oncology at the Vamp itself. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your time this evening. So first of all, uh, I just wanted to touch on why we are having this meeting uh, just briefly, because I want to give uh, the time for other speakers to really talk about it. As we know that the Grampian Health is a big, uh, big service. We, after the amalgamation of the service, we are quite big now. We are covering a lot of uh, areas which we were not before. Uh, ocean, storm are also part of Grampian Health. We are also providing services to many more, which is outside the Grampian Health. Uh, but uh, I think I should be here because the screen recording is happening. Uh, but uh, we are also providing service to Maryboro, which is outside of Grampian Health, but we are delivering service, oncology services there. Previously, I was providing service to Hamilton as well, which is uh, uh, further away, but now we are not going there. Uh, and as you know, Grampian Health is a, has a big uh, catchment area, about 50,000 square kilometers, right from the western edge of Victoria to, uh, uh, to going to South Australian border. Um, we provide comprehensive uh, cancer, cancer care services, which include surgical, medical oncology, radiation oncology. We have a very robust trial unit. We have symptom and urgent review clinics, nursing practitioner-led clinics, the rapture clinic, wellness center, palliative care service, and as I mentioned, clinical trial. I also welcome our director of cancer services, Steve Medwell, who's here. And if I'm slipping somewhere, please, Steve, uh, correct me if I'm uh, going to tell you something wrong. Um, so again, why we are having this meeting is because we want to develop a primary, you know, partnership with the primary uh, care providers. Although we are a comprehensive care service, I suspect some of our patients are not coming to us. We suspect that they are going directly to Melbourne, uh, although there should not be any need for that, because I think if we need to engage those services in Melbourne, we are better suited in some ways. Not to say that you are not doing a great job, but I think we would like to have all the referrals directed towards us. Uh, the idea is to develop brick in the Grampian Health as a cancer care service hub. And in this context, in today's context, we want to become a referral center uh, for the region. We also want to establish melanoma multidisciplinary meeting, which we don't have. We have all sort of uh, MDMs, but not MDMs right now because of the number of patients we don't um, are not getting here. Uh, of course, uh, this is an educational opportunity for the primary care providers and with partnership with PNH. And I'm, I've, I've been told that um, the CPDRs are two hours, which uh, uh, the GPs may accrue. Now, in terms of the statistics, Australia has the highest incidence of uh, malignant melanoma globally. A national average is about 54 cases per 100,000, uh, age standardized ratio. Uh, Victor has a little bit better, about 43 cases per 100,000, but it's a leading cause of death among skin cancers, about six deaths compared to about two deaths in non melanoma cancer. The five year survival rate for the melanoma has increased from 85% to 93% in over decades. Uh, in the use of combination immune therapy, the survival has nearly doubled now. Previously, metastatic melanoma was almost invariably deadly disease with survival of about six months or uh, even less. Still, our, compared to the metropolitan services, patients who are living in regional Victoria have a little bit less um, favorable outcome. Uh, in the period 2019 to 2021, people who were living in the BRICS uh, region uh, were 27% more likely to have melanoma and 38% more likely to have deaths because uh, because of melanoma. The five-year relative survival of patients with metastatic melanoma in our region uh, in the period 2016 to 2020 uh, was 91% compared to 93% for all Victoria. And this is uh, just a graph uh, from the cancerwick.org. As you can see, this is just giving you a breakdown of uh, the, the incident relative likelihood of having melanoma in our region which is about 27% higher. Um, melanoma is more common in males, which is about 50%, 54% compared to females, uh, but um, uh, most likely that's because of, uh, uh, of, the, of the, the kind of job males may be doing as farmers, especially in the Grampians region. Now, I'm not going to say that uh, regarding the uh, 
management of myeloma, I think one thing which we need to understand is there are optimal care pathways. So there is Grampian Regional Cancer Center plan, which is actually uh, prepared uh, under the direction of the Victorian Health Department. And what it does is it seeks to strengthen the regional cancer services by promoting optimal care pathways, use of multidisciplinary meetings, and strengthen referral pathways and enhance use of technology, including telehealth. And what are optimal care pathways? They are essentially a standard of care that should be available to all cancer patients treated in Australia. And these pathways are actually commissioned by the health department and had been ratified and endorsed by various government agencies. Uh, the principles which underpin uh, the optimal care pathways are that it should be patient-centered, the care should be safe and quality, uh, quality care, multidisciplinary care should be provided, the care, supportive care should be available to the patient, the care should be coordinated amongst different disciplines, and there should be a proper communication to the patient, to the primary health care provider, and communication between the providers. And of course, research and clinical trial uh, make uh, a huge contribution to the cancer uh, care, and that's also part of the optimal care pathway. So um, when we talk about uh, optimal care pathway, it really talks about the journey of patient right from the diagnosis till the very end when they are on palliative pathways, you know, end-of-life care. So at each juncture of their cancer journey, optimal care pathways gives you an idea how these patients, what is expected of the care providers. But in terms of today's um, topic, I just wanted to highlight some optimal care pathway timeframes, which are very important. So uh, as per the optimal care pathway for melanoma, biopsy or excision should be done within two weeks of initial GP consult, and the biopsy results should be provided within one week of the biopsy. The referral to the specialist if needed, not all patients are required to go to the specialist, but if needed, should be done within two weeks. And within four weeks of initial diagnosis, in case of unusual pathology, in case of stage three or four disease, or if the treatment is unclear, uh, the MDM discussion should be done, but we don't have any MDMs at the moment. The staging, which includes not only the staging by scans, but also by central liver biopsy, if that's required, should be done within two weeks of a specialist assessment. Radiation therapy, often used in palliative setting, adjuvant setting, it's not that important, but should be done if the MDM decides that within four weeks. Adjuvant systemic therapy should be done within three months and palliative systemic therapy as soon as possible and clinically relevant. So in terms of uh, how we are going to see, Joe has already introduced uh, the Western Victoria Regional Training Hub. I'll invite uh, Dr. James Maher to discuss the primary care management and subsequently Mr. Amit Tadros for to discuss the surgical aspect of melanoma management. James Rizwell, my colleague here, will discuss adjuvant systemic therapy. I'm expecting Dr. Bhushant Pathviraj, who is one of our uh, colleagues. Um, he is also a VMO and provides private uh, oncology services as well to come and present some uh, treatment about melanoma, metastatic melanoma, stage four melanoma, but uh, I'm not sure. He texted me just now that he might be running late or may, may not be able to come today. So if that's the case, I'll, I'll come back and talk to you about metastatic melanoma. And Sue Bartlett, our nursing practitioner here, will talk about immunotherapy toxicity. And finally, Maggie uh, is going to talk about Maggie is hidden. There she is. I'll talk about the clinical trials in melanoma. And these are some of the references to, uh, to my talk here. And I, I extend my sincere thanks to our team uh, who have, have us prepared this event today. Uh, workforce development, uh, workforce development of officers from Primary Health Network, um, which uh, have Naomi White, Jade, um, Helen Gilmore, and also Zoe Swain from Medical Addiction uh, Grampian Health, and Maggie Zhang. I, my special thanks to Maggie because she has worked very hard to attain this uh, outcome today. And that's, that has been really special. She has been coordinating between all of us and, and has done a really nice job. Please do provide feedback after the event uh, so that we can keep on engaging with you in the future, not only melanoma, with other tumor streams as well. So thank you very much. So thank you, Dr. Sharma. Uh, very happy to hear from you. I'll now hand over to Dr. James Ma, primary care 
Skin Cancer General Practitioner and Fellow of Skin Cancer College Australasia. Dr. Ma is from Alfredton Medical Centre, uh, Skin Cancer Ballarat. Welcome, Dr. James Ma. Just no. Thank you uh, for inviting me. Thanks, Maggie, for all the uh, work you did uh, getting me organised. Uh, my talk's not quite on the primary care management, it's on some aspects of primary care management, but uh, not totally on uh, primary care um, management. Um, this is just, I thought, I'd, we've got a very vibrant uh, primary, uh, uh, <laughs> primary care skin cancer. Uh, GP team and nurses, and um, this is a few of us who were up at the Australasian um, Skin Cancer Congress in uh, in uh, May this year. If you look around, you'll see a few others. Linda, I see uh, over there as well, and Jude. And um, I don't think I have any conflict of interest re um, relating to this talk. A little bit um, about who I am. on a, a GP and I work in skin cancer at Skin Cancer Ballarat. Co located at Alfred Medical Centre. Still work as a rural GP in Creswick and Clunes, where I've been for 32 years. Um, I developed a keen in interest in skin cancer just due to all the farmers and things I saw out in uh, the uh, Creswick and Clunes area. Uh, I started my further training in skin cancer in 2008. Quite um, a while, but um, I progressed through training through the Skin Cancer College of Australasia and um, uh, obtained fellowship with them in 2013. Um, since that time, I didn't count before then, but uh, I didn't find a lot of melanomas until I did a bit extra, a bit of extra training. But since then, um, I've exercised over um, 8,000 skin cancers and um, over 550 melanomas. Um, I still do a bit of tutoring for the Skin Cancer College. Um, they run an educational blog that runs every weekday, and I pop up there occasionally with an educational post. And I also tutor for Deakin University in skin cancer. Um, I've got some topics here I was going to run through. Now, a lot of these topics could just about be a talk in themselves. So um, it'll just be a bit of a quick, a quick run through. I've got 15 minutes, so um, I'll do what I can. The, um, I guess the first thing I wanted to run through was uh, just how important um, GPs are for um, uh, melanoma diagnosis and management. Um, run through a little bit about where GPs who uh, develop an interest in skin cancer can upskill. Um, uh, how well do the GPs who've um, um, done further training in skin cancer, you know, do they do well? Um, then um, a quick look at the guidelines, a little bit about total body photography, serial dermoscopic imaging, a little bit about artificial intelligence, um, and a little bit about teledermatology, and I, I think that'll see me out. Um, I think this has already been co covered, but melanoma is the second most common cancer in men and women, and third overall, excluding non-melanoma skin cancer. Um, lifetime risk of 6.7%. And uh, when I started, um, it was um, the ninth most common cause of cancer death. Uh, now it's 10th, and it's soon to be 11th. Um, and in 2020, uh, you can see there that uh, there were 1,400 deaths due to uh, Melanoma in Australia. Um, one thing I thought when we were at the recent Congress, they um, they ran through the Q the Q skin uh, study, which was um, which showed the importance of melanoma in primary care. Uh, it was done in our our northern neighbours in Queensland, uh, and it was it was quite a eye opening study for me. They um, it was a pers prospective study from two thousand eleven to two thousand and nineteen. And uh, they recruited 44,000 Queensland residents between 40 and 69 years, and 1,683 of them had melanoma, of which about two thirds were in situ melanoma. Um, lifetime risk of melanoma, 6.7% there. And uh, interestingly, 77% of those melanomas were diagnosed in primary care. So um, a very big role for primary care in melanoma diagnosis. Um, 14.8% were diagnosed by dermatologists. And as you can see, that doesn't leave a huge amount for everyone else to diagnose. So um, there was a few other little interesting um, figures they pulled out of the study. One was that um, if a dermatologist or a plastic surgeon diagnosed your melanoma, you were much more likely to be um, an urban dweller. And I think that sort of reflects that they're 
um, and more dermatologists and plastic surgeons in the urban centres. Uh, there were 63 per cent for primary care. The other little interesting figure was that um, for those holding a, a university degree, 45% um, of their melanomas would be diagnosed by a dermatologist, 42% by a plastic surgeon, and 23% by GPs, just indicating that particularly in the more rural areas, GPs um, are, are very busy diagnosing melanomas. And 80% um, uh, of the cases, the second procedure was performed in primary care. So uh, an important role there. Um, so having discussed the uh, importance of GPs in um, um, melanoma and skin cancer, uh, I thought I'd just run quickly through where can you upskill? Um, I did my extra training through the Skin Cancer College of Australasia, um, the Australian College of Dermatologists um, and the Southern Smart Runner um, program for um, GPs to upskill in melanoma. It's quite a good one because if you're lucky, you get a free um, uh, 1500 dermatoscope, uh, 1500 dollar dermatoscope out of it. So that's always worthwhile. And um, the University of Queensland runs a master's program, Health Cert, and uh, some others run the programs as well. Um, I thought just to mention the Skin Cancer College of Australasia. It's the peak not for profit um, primary care skin cancer organisation. Um, it has um, multiple craft groups. You don't have to be in primary care. There's um, pathologists who are members, there's plastic surgeons who are members, there's dermatologists who are members, there's international members, there's several overseas um, dermatologists who present on our skin cancer uh, blog regularly. And it has um, four pillars, uh, which were education, um, standards of care, advocacy about uh, skin cancer and research. And um, they also run uh, a um, accredited um, primary care skin cancer program so that you can be assured if you visit one of those doctors they've um they've done a further training in skin cancer and they also have a very useful find a uh, find a doctor program where you can put in your postcode or your town and find someone who's done extra training in skin cancer and any profits that the college makes because not-for-profits can make a profit um they go back to either education standards advocacy or research so that, that's my preferred organisation. Um, this is the, the picture of their um, their web page, and as you can see, you know you might type in um, "locate a doctor in Horsham." You probably find David Lester up there somewhere, um, and uh, he works for Skin Face Body in Horsham. Um, and then you can also, and it'll it'll show you the um, uh, the accredited doctors in skin cancer. Um, they also have a lot of patient education um, materials. They have a nice little page on um, for patients um, called Scan Your Skin. And uh, the uh, if you go there, you can find a nice little video on how to do a skin check of your skin. And um, so great place for things. They 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 like um, um, the uh, the heading sore, so any lesion that's painful or not healing, any changing lesion, one that looks abnormal, the ugly duckling, or a new lesion. And that might suggest you should pop in and get your skin checked. Um, they, their programs are quite comprehensive. More recently, they've um, developed some short courses for hairdressers, massage therapists, and allied health that have been very popular because they can play an important role in picking up melanomas on the scalp, or maybe when your physio's um, checking your back or something. Um, so they're quite affordable and they're quite short. Um, they have uh, some essential certificate type courses in dermoscopy and um, skin cancer surgery. They have more a more uh, advanced six month uh, course in dermoscopy or another six month course in skin cancer surgery, which has small group tutorials. Uh, they have a dermoscopy histology correlation program. They have a fellowship program that runs over about five years, and they also have useful patient educational materials. Um, this is just an example of uh, if you log onto their website and you, this is what you might you might see uh, for the certificate of skin cancer um, medicine. Great starting point if you um, you haven't um, done one before. They often have a weekend uh, um, course you go and visit as well as some um, some cases to submit and other things. Um, 
this, uh, the Australian College of Dermatologists uh, gets funding from the Victoria government to run a uh, certificate of practical dermoscopy. Um, I didn't know I was on the, I was uh, famous for appearing on their page. I, um, <laughs> I, uh, I had a couple of registrars that wanted a um, new dermatoscope and we had two practices and um, as I'm involved in the teaching of registrars, I said, I'll, I'll go along with you too and we'll make it part of our, our teaching program. And as luck would have it, one forgot to enrol, the other one uh, um, had some life event come up, come up and I ended up just being there by myself. But <laughs> that's um, Tony Sutherland's wife, Jill Ramsey. She um, a well-known GP in the town who's recently retired. But look, that, that's a good course as well. And it's free and uh, you can get a free dermatoscope, one free dermatoscope per practice. And um, yeah, it runs, I think, once or twice a year and you can log on and get some uh, information there. Um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about are the courses um, effective? Um, I was lucky enough to be involved in um, three published research articles um, uh, that were um, organised by Jer Jeremy Hay. Um, the, uh, a lot of us um, take part in a, a thing called the, uh, the SCARD or the Skin Cancer Audit, and I just checked it today. It, it's been running since the... Um, uh, early 2000s, and it has uh, 1.57 million skin cancer specimens now, and uh, over 41,000 melanomas, and there's 1,590 doctors who contribute to it. It's a useful surgical order to you put your patient in. It's yellow when it um, gives you wait for the procedure to be done. Um, uh, red when it uh, sorry, I don't remember the colours it goes, but it has a thing where you're waiting for histology. And then if it needs further action, it's red, sort of a bit like a traffic light. And when it's finished, it's green. But it's got a lot of really useful information of what happens with melanomas in primary care. And um, one of the studies um, we, uh, we uh, did was uh, in 2002, Jeremy Hay was the main author. And um, we looked at our melanomas for 27 of us in um, 2013. So we had a bit of follow-up time for these. For these people, 589 melanomas between the 27 uh, doctors involved. And um, uh, basically, when we looked at the, um, we followed all our patients up and we found that uh, um, these, the, um, the GPs were following the Australian uh, guidelines and the five year survival uh, with respect to melanoma was at least as favourable as the national population based metric. So that was nice to hear that. The, the GPs were doing well. Um, and the other thing we looked at, um, it was a number needed to treat. We used an indirect measure, which is how many melanomas um, or how many moles do you remove to find one melanoma? Obviously, you can have a very low number to treat if you only chop out the worst melanomas. So we also uh, tend to look at the number of in situ melanomas, and we like to see more in situ than invasive. And um, uh, the, the number in 2013 was 5.73, which was um, lower than um, a, a sort of 36 um, studies uh, reporting number number needed to treat in 2019. Now, um, it's nice to see that number, but it, it's not strictly comparable, but um, I thought I'd pop it in there anyway, because it was interesting showing that we're doing okay. Um, with another reason to do a bit of skin cancer training might be that you can brush up a few of your surgical skills. Um, and he's very busy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if we can, and the base hospital um, surgical, plastic surgical outpatients is really busy. So if we can uh, do some procedures and um, things, uh, it certainly will help the waiting list. The uh, chap on the left had a, a, a lead tiger maligner on his chin. He used to have a little skin flap to repair that. And this other chap, even though it looks like a melanoma, that was actually a, an SDC, and he's just had a little wedge resection of his lip. But um, they can be done quite easily in primary care with the right equipment. Uh, a little bit on the um, melanoma guidelines, just making sure that everybody knows that um, they're available. They've got a really, really good um, executive summary, so you don't have to read through everything. And it's in a question and answer sort of format. And they're, they're on the wiki platform so they can be updated. They were jointly funded by the Skin Cancer College. That's where some of their, their not-for-profit money went to and by the Australian College of um, Dermatologists. And uh, um, they're 
highly recommend it. I think next year they're having an update. And that's the uh, address for those. And I think I mentioned that. And I've got a little list of the, uh, just an example here. This is what you might uh, see. It's got good, uh, good practice points in uh, melanoma. For example, you know, what you do with high risk patients. Um, what's an evidence-based recommendation and it also lists the quality of the evidence. And you'll notice right at the very bottom, I don't know how easy that is to read, but it says individuals at very high risk of melanoma and their partner or carer uh, should be ed educated to recognise and document suspicious uh, lesions, suspicious of melanoma. Uh, these individuals should be checked regularly by a clinician with a six monthly full skin examination supported by total body photography and demoscopy. So obviously, if you're seeing a significant number of patients with uh, pigmented lesions or skin cancers, um, it's important that you uh, learn some demoscopy. Um, that's my little jump into total body photography. Um, total body photography um, is useful, particularly for um, high risk patients. And um, one of the main uses of total body photography is that uh, up to 10% of melanomas are featureless or feature poor. And if you've got a, um, a changing or a new lesion showing up on your total body photography, particularly in the high risk patient, um, you can often pick them up before uh, they show definite features of melanoma. The other benefit is that um, you're four times less likely to have a benign lesion excise. So if you don't like having spots all the time, especially these patients who have hundreds of nevi, you know, and especially if some of them are atypical, they're having spots off all the time. So if you don't want those off, um, get some total body photography. And I find that it, it has um, a lot of patient reassurance in between their checkups with the GP. You've got a spot, is that new? I've got lots of funny spots. You can go to your photos. Nowadays, you can um, have your photos on an app um, and uh, have a look. And if it was there before and it hasn't changed, well, you don't need to visit the doctor. If it uh, wasn't there and it's new, well, time to come in for a visit. Um, Here's a nice example of total body photography. I don't know if anyone saw this article on um, on the ABC News. Um, this is a professor from the Queensland Institute of Technology, I think, and uh, one of my uh, primary care skin cancer GP colleagues uh, saw him on the on on the news and uh, thought the spot on his face looked a bit worrying. And being a very diligent uh, GP, he actually googled him on the net and went back and found some photos of him from before and uh, realised that this was a new or changing lesion and uh, sent him an email and lo and behold, we had his uh, lentigo malignar excised off his, off his face and he said he wants to give uh, Graham Siggs, who was the, uh, the GP who um, uh, diagnosed that, a, a beer and a hug next time he's in South Australia. So there you are. And so total body photography, looking for changing lesions can be quite useful, even if it's on the internet. So I thought I'd also uh, talk a little bit more about um, total body photography. Obviously, the, the better quality, quality images they have, you have, the more likely you're going to um, see change or you're going to uh, see new lesions. Um, uh, we use some cross-polarised images, and I'll just give a quick little chat about that. Um, artificial intelligence can be used to help detect those new lesions. You can put two total body photography side by side in a derm engine, for example, and it will tell you whether um, one of those is new. It still needs a doctor to review those images, but can be useful. And uh, I could mention about um, Vector, which is a um, quite expensive, but quite exciting form of total body photography. So this is some um, total body photography we use. So Amy is our total body photography expert. Um, we use a couple of studio lights and a high quality SLR camera. You, I haven't put the slide up here, but on the back of those studio lights is a polarizing film and it's at 90 degrees to the polarizing lens on the camera. And it just stops all reflection off the, um, off the lesions. And you can, uh, you can get you know, a bit of an idea of the demoscopy of it. So there's, there's two photos there. Both the blown up images are just taken off the, the full back um, total body photography, and you can see on the uh, on the lesion where the over here on the left, I guess on the left, you can see that that particular lesion that's uh, in yellow circles up there. You can get a, a bit of an idea of what the dermoscopy might be like, and that really helps you. That that extra bit of detail 
actually helps you uh, um, work out um, what has changed. Um, the uh, the chap on the right, again, that little lesion circled in blue. Um, I think my uh, my little image is over that one, but uh, I don't know if I can move myself. But yeah, I can. And you can see again, get an idea of the demoscopy on that. Um, with normal um, total body photography, you would just have the um, the the colour and the outline of the image to be able to view. And the more information you have, the, the better. Uh, this is a little bit, we use that um, or a program called Derm Engine, and I'll just move myself again. The, um, the uh, if you've got some total body photography images, uh, it can use um, AI to uh, compare the two images. And you might notice on here that on the right hand side, there's a series of um, matched um, lesions, but this one here uh, in the light blue, it says possible change detected, and uh, it would outline that particular lesion for special attention as, as a possible new um, new lesion that might need checking on the uh, on the patient. Uh, Vectra is a, is an exciting technology. Um, one of our Queensland uh, colleagues installed it. Uh, I think he said it cost him five hundred thousand um, with a five year maintenance contract. So. Not for the faint-hearted, you want to have a few skin cancer patients, I think. Um, I think Sinclair Dermatology in Melbourne has one. And I think they might even have, you might be able to get partially funded by a research program if you've got lots of uh, funny, funny needle. I think that's what here. But she, I think one of her patients um, um, was recently enrolled in, in that. And it has about, I think, something like 90 cameras. And in just a few seconds, it takes, um, instantaneous photos of, of your whole body and it can uh, stitch them all together that you actually have a 3D model where all the spots are on your spot, body. You can ask it, show me all the pink and brown lesions that might be suspicious for melanomas. Show me all the large lesions. Show me the lesions you don't think are melanoma and Vector can do those and it arrange them in a nice little spiral graph. And so it's quite amazing technology, but just not readily available uh, Unless you can afford to go, and I don't. There's there's um some in regional Queensland or New South Wales, but and um but I don't know that there are any in regional Victoria. Um, these are just some examples of the um the types of images that Vectra can bring up, and again, sort of close to dermoscopic quality. Um, uh, so you know, very useful images to have. Um, I just put a little bit here. Sometimes if we have a, um, a low risk lesion that maybe it doesn't look quite right, but it hasn't got any clues to melanoma, um, sometimes we'll monitor a lesion, particularly if it's in a um, cosmetically significant site and you don't want to pop a scar on there. Um, we, we like to have flat lesions. Obviously, if it's raised, it could be an invasive melanoma, so you're not going to monitor that. It should be impalpable and it shouldn't have any clues to melanoma. And most commonly, images are taken at three to four months. If it hasn't changed in three to four months, it's got a 99% chance it's benign. And then it's 12 months to follow up to detect any slow growing melanomas. Um, with um, through dermoscopic imaging, its focal changes are most significant. So, a bit dark, generally darker, a bit generally lighter, earlier spots, we don't worry so much about them. And here's one of my patients and the lesion on the left was the one he presented with, which was just a little bit of a larger lesion. About the only thing I could see in it was um, it had one little sort of clod just up there. And at three months, you can see he's had quite focal change with a whole lot of uh, um, new uh, globules or clods in the, in, the, uh, in the image on the right. And uh, it's a good example of the biology of melanoma that, um, you know, they tend to grow, they tend to be chaotic. And uh, you could also see some new vessels, um, a bit hard to see on the slide, but um, that was melanoma in situ uh, that this chap had. And following on from that, I thought I'd just pop in that um, a lot of the um, demoscopy programs now will give you, oh, sorry, <laughs> move me again. Yep. Um, a lot of the demoscopy programs now use artificial intelligence and deep learning computers to give you an assessment of whether something's likely to be um, 
melanoma or not. They're definitely not perfect, but um, they are improving. And uh, we were talking to the Derm Engine people, and they've they've act they've actually um, applied for TGA approval for their um, deep learning computer to assist GPs in in melanoma diagnosis. So um, I guess that's a, a good thing. Um, uh, several of us took part in a in a study that was run at the University of Vienna, and um, we had to compete against this deep learning computer. And it was pretty hard to beat, although you, we would typically work on, should I remove this spot or not? Um, but that wasn't the question. You actually had to give an exact diagnosis. And um, the uh, computer was quite hard to beat when it came to just giving an exact diagnosis. But unfortunately, it would also make some real clangers. You know, it would get some really obvious ones wrong. And a secondary um, outcome of the study was that uh, we'd always thought people were expert in demoscopy after three years, but we found that five-year people were better than three years and 10-year people were better than five years. So, you know, life of this hope for us oldies. <laughs> um, teledermatoscopy, I won't spend very long on this because I know my time's running short. Um, sometimes it can be really simple. Um, one of uh, the GPs I used to work with, uh, Jared Kilday, he, um, he just sends me a thing and he says, Surely this can't be a Seb K, can it? And uh, <laughs> I said, surely it's not. Um, and when we're talking about just melanoma services at Ballarat, I just want to highlight this one. So it, he's not a Ballarat patient, this one, but he would be a good talking point because this is a 78-year-old man and he's got a 2.5 millimetre thick melanoma. And the issues I had are, well, I know when you're 85, you've got no survival benefit from sentinel lymph node biopsy, but he's 78. Um, this was quite a big melanoma and quite thick, and he was going to need um, uh, probably a fairly complex reconstruction. And typically when we're referring to Ballarat, the surgeons do the sentinel lymph node biopsies for us. Um, we don't have a plastic service and a sentinel lymph node service um, at present that I'm aware of. And I was just sort of wondering, uh, you know, and if I send him to Melbourne, I know he'll be seen in a week. He'll have a multidisciplinary team, which is great to hear us talking about. Um, and, uh, you know, he'll be fixed quite soon and they'll decide, you know, whether head and neck sentinel lymph node biopsy, well, it's a little bit dodgy in the best of circumstances. And uh, so I thought maybe that might be something one of our speakers might like to address. You know, is that something that Ballarat now could handle? It'd be great if we could. Um, the, uh, the other one I sent away recently was a a vulval melanoma, and I'm guessing not because I referred it to melanoma service and they referred it to Guyne Yonk, and they said they see one every five years. So uh, I'm guessing that's probably not going to be one of our services. Having said that, if they do go to Melbourne, I always tell them to come back for any immuno if they need um, immunotherapy, even if they need complex reconstruction or something down in Melbourne. A um, bit more on teledermatoscopy. Um, we, as I mentioned, there's multiple apps. I've just mentioned this one because Derm Engine is what we use. Um, patients have their own little app. Their total body photography is, is on their app. They can actually upload images um, themselves onto the app for sending to us. If they attend another doctor who uses Derm Engine, they can give permission for that doctor to have access to all their photos. I can actually um, send their images um, directly to the pathologist via um, Derm Engine. So there's a lot of um, scope for teledermatoscopy. Uh, and look, what I've touched on, you could talk about it for hours. There's patient apps that, um, you know, not maybe not so good at this time, but um, you, could, you could do a whole talk on the topic. But uh, I thought I'd just touch on some of those, those things there. So I think that pretty well um, is the end of uh, what I wanted to say. So if there are any questions, are we doing them all at the end? I think or? we're doing questions at the end for Perfect. the panel. Just just right away. Thank you, Dr. Ma. We're going to welcome Dr. Amir Tadros, who's a, a consultant plastic surgeon at Grampian Health. We're just going to do a little tech shift here. Can you see okay? Yeah. All right, so uh, I'm 
So I'll just take the next one. Okay. Hi, I'm Amir Tadros. I'm one of the, I'm the plastic surgeon in Barra, but uh, the only one. Um, but I also work in Geelong and Melbourne. I came here in 2019 um, from the UK. Um, and I was asked to come here by one of the plastic surgeons in Melbourne um, to try and set up a, a service in, in Grampian. I used to work for NHS Grampian, and now I work for Grampian Health, so it's very similar. Um, I have no declaration other than I don't really like talking very much and get nervous. So. so I was going to talk to you about a few topics. One is imaging, wild local excision for melanoma stage one and two, central lymph node biopsy, therapeutic lymph node resection, and the high-risk referrals. So um, this is my uh, protocol, uh, management plan for stage one and two. Um, I use that for all, all the hospitals that I work in. The, the main thing is the staging in situ is five millimeter margin. Stage 1A, which is less than 0.8 millimeters, according to AGCC, is uh, 10 millimeters. Stage 1B, stage 2, stage 1B is one mill 10 millimeters. Stage 2A is two, two centimeters, and then stage 2B, 2C is two centimeters. The interesting thing that is also we need to be aware of is when we refer for sentinel node biopsies, and with the changes that I'm going to talk to you later on, um, normally um, sentinel node biopsy for stage 1B, anything above 0.8 millimeters will be um, considered for uh, central lymph node biopsy. Um, the imaging, basically you look at imaging uh, for stage 2B and, and above. So um, anything less than stage 2B, you don't really tend to do much in the way of imaging. Follow-up is also variable according to the stage that you're, you're at. So what, what happened, what changed? So I grew up in the old system pre-October 2018 in the UK. So plastic surgeons were responsible for most of the treatments for stage one to three. Um, we regularly operated on patient stage four and oncology was basically an afterthought um, for stage four. Once you're diagnosed with stage two, stage three, it's basically a very slow process to death. And whenever that is, we, we don't really know, but it, it's basically a death sentence. Um, and it was, oncology was, to us, was a type of surgical failure. Um, so surgery was a monotherapy for melanoma and then oncology was just the last ditch effort to try and prolong life for a little bit longer. After 2018, we got into the system of immunotherapy, um, completely changed the management of um, melanoma. Um, and now my role is basically stage one to two, um, managed uh, with oncology and ideally in an MDM. So most of my patients, complex ones, I will discuss in the Geelong MDM. Uh, and hopefully we'll have an MDM in Ballarat soon to, to discuss these cases rather than have to refer them to, to Geelong or Melbourne. Um, I think with the way things are going, there may be oncology for stage two as well, um, and in which case our role will just be for stage one melanoma. So how do we know uh, the stages? So we need to identify the group of patients who have progression of the disease at a microscopic level. And, and that's basically looking for a needle in a haystack. Um, once we do this, once we've identified microscopic disease, then we then they become stage three. Um, central node biopsies, um, lymph node surgery was, everyone quotes John Hunter, but actual fact, it was Herbert Snow who uh, described five cases of melanoma, and he 
was the first person to link melanoma with the uh, nodes. And um, he said that you can't really cut out the melanoma without removing the nodes. And what's funny is that he uh, mentions that basically lymphadenectomy is a safe and easy measure. And in those days, there was no general anesthetic. So I, I dread to think how he did his lymphadenectomies um, safely and easily. So elective node dissection exposes patients to lots of complications. Um, about 80% of the patients who have melanoma won't have lymph node metastases. And some cases, as I found to my horror, with the best intention in the world, stage four, you'll do a case, very complex uh, excision reconstruction only for the patient to pass away a few weeks later. You think you're doing something good, but in reality, you're not really helping them at all. So no effect on survival for surgery is monotherapy. Um, and as, as I said here, the best way to find a needle is to, to remove the whole haystack. Is that is that really something very good, even if there's no needle in the haystack? So ele elective lymph node dissection isn't really that um, good. What about observation? So you'll need to get a bigger needle with a smaller haystack to see if you can get the node. But um, if you do go for lymph node observation, um, that if you do find a lymph node, that will be the patients who can benefit from um, possible um, therapeutic lymph node dissection. But is the delay to observation to get the node that's palpable, is that going to cause more distant spread? And for that reason, central lymph node biopsy is a happy medium. Um, when I was training, central node biopsy was a very controversial issue. Um, I swayed between yes and no, yes and no, um, multiple times. And most of, the, most of the problem was to do with the head and neck central node biopsies. In addition, we didn't really have any treatment for, for patients. Um, if we found there's an external biopsy that was positive, so it's it basically a staging tool. Um, and so when I was training, I didn't really feel that, sometimes I didn't feel there's a need for the central node biopsy. Um, and at the time, we thought, can early diagnosis of stage three uh, mean that we can cure the melanoma? Um, until until that period, we were, we were umming and ahhing, but then the MSLT2 trials came in. And that's basically, uh, that was the game changer uh, for plastic surgery. Um, 2004, 2014, ECOC status 01, um, and they looked at melanomas from uh, one millimeter onwards. Uh, and they looked at the patients who were positive for central lymph node biopsies. And then they went to two, two arms. First arm was just clinical observation. Second arm was completion lymphadenectomy and then observation. What they found was that there's no difference in survival between doing a lymphadenectomy in someone or observing. There was a slightly higher disease-free survival period in the control. So they didn't have much in the way of uh, annoying um, ulcerating groin nodes or axillary nodes or neck nodes, but they had a much higher uh, level of lymphedema. So we're not doing them any favors by carrying out a lymph node dissection. So as a result, surgery is a monotherapy, can provide local disease control, and you have to pay for that price. You have to, a 24% risk of lymphedema, but no improved uh, survival rates. And so you have to ask yourself, is is lymphadenectomy um, any, any use? Um, so central nerve, nerve biopsy is a therapeutic invent, intervention. It predicts prognosis, um, but it has a uh, false uh, negative uh, rate. And sometimes it can give you the wrong results. Um, so you have to take it with a pinch of salt sometimes. Uh, surgical management of lymph nodes. So of the lymph nodes that are positive, we know that 20% will go on to develop uh, lymph node metastases. Um, is it worth taking out all the lymph nodes um, in 80% of the patients who will never develop um, METs? And, and obviously the answer is no. 
So the role of surgery in melanoma, um, diagnostic, the initial biopsy for staging, uh, wide excision, um, then refer it to oncology, central node biopsy for stage 1B to see if we can upregulate stage 3 disease and then uh, access the funding for immunotherapy, uh, and then biopsy to exclude stage 4 disease. Um, and then my role also for local disease control, stage 3 disease, stage 4 disease, which is palliative. And even then, I take that with a very big pinch of salt. Sometimes I'm not doing them any favors by doing the stage 4 disease. Um, go on to, again, just to the, the actual um, patients that will be useful for central node biopsy, just to drum it in. Stage 1B uh, or above will be um, central node biopsy patients. Um, and so you're just um, trying to outweigh risk benefit ratio. Um, and this is the this is the interesting bit. So before with the MSLT2 trials, it was one, milli one millimeter melanoma. The AGCC guidelines now changed everything to 0.8 to one melanoma. So we've got a gray area between 0.8 and one millimeter, which where we have a 5% risk of a positive central node biopsy, but we have a 10% risk of complications. So the, the risk uh, benefit ratio is almost the same. And I think this is a group that will benefit uh, most from um, the central node biopsy as well as the intermediate risk. The high risk patients have a 10% uh, negative central lymph node biopsy rate. And the reason they have that is because there is a thicker tumors have a 10% hematogenous spread. So the lymph nodes may not be the, the only way for, for spread of the melanoma. So SLMB assumptions, we're assuming that the melanoma metastasize to the central lymph node first, as, as I've said before, thick melanomas will spread hematogenously and role for other staging modalities such as PET CT, CT, MRI scans. Um, we're also assuming the radioactive tracer will accumulate in the same sentinel lymph node. Um, and that's where we have the lymphosome concept. So in plastic surgery, we have an angiosome concept where one particular patch of skin is supplied by one particular vessel. Uh, lymphosome also assumes that one particular area of the body is supplied by one particular lymphatic uh, gland, lymphatic channel. Um, so my principle for staging. Uh, consider for all melanomas over 0.8 millimeters. If the performance status is zero or one, if they've got a higher performance status, then sometimes you, you have to discuss with oncology to see whether or not they'll benefit from the immunotherapy. If they've got any other concomitant disease, microscopic disease, um, it usually requires a GA um, and false negative requires long-term follow-ups if, uh, if you're going to have to be 100% sure. As I said before, it's a staging tool, not treatment. And if they're not suitable for central node biopsy because of GA, then we're going for wide local excision with local, an local anesthetic. The complications of central node biopsies are not insignificant. So 5 to 10% of false negative, as we said, just because of the thicker tumors, um, where sometimes we can't identify the nodes. Um, anaphylaxis is one in 2000, which is fairly high. Um, always warn patients that their urine is going to be dark for about three or four weeks um, from the uh, patent blue dye. Uh, all patients get seroma regardless of uh, whether people say yes or no. And this is the interesting one, 1 1.3% risk of lymphedema, and that's lifelong lymphedema. Uh, nerve injury is 0.3%. So what do we do? So we've got technetium, uh, which is the, called technetium because it's the first uh, manufactured, man-made manufactured isotope, uh, the first to come out from a nuclear um, um, method. And technetium is um, technetium metastate, technetium M, 99 technetium M has a, has a half-life of six hours. Um, and so you need about five half-lives for it to reach normal levels again. So there, it's a perfect isotope because it degrades fairly rapidly, as opposed to technetium-99, which is a half-life of 200,000 years. So obviously, we can't use technetium-99, but use technetium-99M, uh, which is a metastate. The colloid that's bounded and also has a half-life of four hours, so it 
it, it's removed from the body fairly quickly. Um, once they've had the uh, technetium, they go through to a spectrum scanner. Um, and this is the lymphosome um, idea of certain areas of the body will, will drain to different um, nodes. Um, so this is a case I did in uh, Geelong where the melanoma was excised from the midline. And we have four separate regions which lit up once they injected with technetium. And so you can sometimes get quite confusing issues where you're going to be chasing the, um, the node, central node. Uh, what do we do once we've done central node? So in the anesthetic room, we measure the background, uh, inject uh, patent blue at the site, mark the central node location, and do a two centimeter wide local excision. Ideally, we'd have a two millimeter margin of excision around the initial melanoma. And the reason for a two millimeter is because we want to standardize the data so that everything is the same. One of the reasons why we get false negative results is the uh, margin is larger than two millimeters. So you're taking a big chunk of tissue out and then we're putting patent blue dye in and radioactive isotope around it but that's not exactly where the lesion was. So you will get a negative false, uh, uh, false negative. Then you do a blue dye infiltration, tell the anesthetist that the blue dye is going in in case of anaphylactic reaction. Then I usually go for the uh, central node first and we're looking for a hot blue node using a cam gamma probe. Um, that's in the axilla, groin or neck, uh, different types of retractors that I'll be using. Um, and then we use the gamma probe to look for the hot blue nodes. And then we measure the radiation for the next 10 seconds. And then look at once I've removed the node, I'm looking for 10% rule. So if there's 10% of the radiation still there, uh, then there might be another node that I've missed. Uh, and, then, and then we do the wide local excision. Um, sometimes it can be difficult to, to get the exact nodes um, so this melanoma lower lid reconstructed with a forehead flap. And in, in those cases, you may or may not get the right node just because it's, it's quite close to um, the node. The ideal central node is somewhere where you've got a long distance to travel between the melanoma and the, and the draining um, um, lymphatic um, patch. Uh, uh, lymphatic node. Um, so something like this, you'll do an injection um, and then the, the scanner, they'll have a, a chance to do the scan. It'll take more than 10 seconds to reach the groin nodes. Something like this is, is a lot more complex where you're injecting. And as soon as you've injected the isotope, you're getting everything lighting up in the, in the first few seconds. So you'll miss the central node. So these, that's why these are high-risk patients um, where you've got the tumor just next to the draining nodes. Um, when I was in St. Thomas's, we, we, we um, set up a new system where we're using infrared cameras as the injection. And that was a 3D uh, infrared camera that was connected to the uh, gamma probe. And you put these glasses on. And you can identify um, the draining nodes fairly quickly as soon as you've injected um, radioisotope. Um, and it's quite good for, for the head and neck cancer cases. Um, I do a fair bit of um, stage three, stage four, as I said, not as much as before. Um, and the reason we, we do them is, is because of false negative central node. Um, patients are stage three at presentation or patients who have declined central node biopsies uh, and also for debulking and resistant, uh, uh, resistant nodes. So the idea is to remove all contents of the basin and for palpable disease and for reduction of load. Um, this is a Ballarat case for whose melanoma axillary uh, uh, lateral chest wall, lots of mets um, and that's the marking prior to surgery where I could feel actual palpable nodes. Once I started opening, I could see uh, in transit and satellite metastases everywhere. And so we went on for a full axillary dissection. 
um, closure with a lat dorsi flap um, to try and um, close the defect. Um, this is another one from Geelong. And so you, you could argue that you could leave something like this because it doesn't have much of a life expectancy. But we decided to go for um, tumor excision, uh, parotidectomy, um, neck dissection. And because you can't put um, skin graft directly onto the bone after he's had a nucleation, he had a fascia lata flap, which was anastomosed onto the carotid artery and jugular vein um, to give you the lining and then a skin graft on top of that to re reconstruct the orbital globe. Um, and he actually did quite well. He's, he's still alive two or three years later. Um, and that's that's it. Any questions at all? We're, I think we're still holding questions for the end. Thank you very much. If the whole room was enthralled there. Thank you, Dr. Tarn. Um, I'd like to introduce now um, Dr. James uh, Ridgewell, uh, who's a medical oncologist at Grand South. Would you like to stand or sit? You happy? We'll, we'll stay where we are. I might change the screen. Um, good day, everyone. My name's James. Nice to meet you all. Um, so, uh, I guess I'm the newest oncologist at, at Brick. Um, I work here and at Geelong as well. Um, no affiliations to declare. Um, so, I thought I'd just start off by talking about melanoma 101 in terms of basic biology, because it's really important for us in terms of our current treatment. Uh, so melanoma is a very aggressive form of skin cancer. I guess I'm fairly proud to say that uh, Australians have made a major impact in terms of research across the last 10 years. Uh, places like Peter Mac, the Alfred Melanoma Institute Australia have been really, really pivotal in a number of clinical trials. Um, if you ever are looking at clinical trials from the last five to 10 years and you look at the names of the authors or the, the sites, a number of them have lead authors, which are Australian lead authors. Um, adjuvant treatment just refers to any treatment which is supplemental to a definitive therapy, such as surgery or radiation. And that's mostly what I'm going to talk about today. Um, at the moment, our risk stratification is based off traditional staging me measures. Um, within a number of clinical trials, they are looking at newer, newer methods of trying to risk stratify patients, such as with circulating DNA and, and these sorts of things. But at the moment, our most accurate measure is still traditional staging. Um, so in order to help understand the treatments we employ, it's oh, really um, uh, it's important to understand a little bit about the biology of melanoma. Uh, a healthy melanocyte must undergo a series of genetic mutations or alterations to transform that cell into a malignant clone. Um, certain genetic mutations are commonly seen in melanoma. The, the most important of which is mutation of the BRAF protein, which is part of the MAP kinase uh, pathway, which you probably remember kind of from medical school. Um, for us, the V600E mutation occurs in about 45% of patients, and it's, it's critically important both in terms of as a prognostic factor, but also for treatment decisions. Um, there are a number of other frequent mutations, but they've yet to be exploited for treatment purposes. Um, currently, there are th three BRAF inhibitors, all of which are co-prescribed with a MEK inhibitor, which is just the next protein in the pathway. Um, early trials from metastatic disease showed that the addition of a MEK inhibitor uh, both delayed the development of resistance, but also improved the tolerability of BRAF inhibitors. Uh, for adjuvant disease, there's currently one which is uh, approved, which is dibrafenib with trametinib. Uh, oops. Um, our knowledge of immune regulation and dis dysregulation in the development and progression of cancer continues to evolve. There are a number of factors which act as useful prognostic markers for melanoma and other cancers. Um, things that can be measured or reported within the pathology report or supplemental information include things such as tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, 
uh, PD-1, uh, tumor mutation burden, all of these act as surrogate markers for the immunogenicity of a cancer. Um, localized tumors, which are noted to have tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, commonly have lower recurrence rates. PD-1 expression has utility for a variety of cancers for predicting the benefit of given treatments. And tumor mutation burden is correlated with the likelihood of benefit from immune therapies. Uh, for immunotherapy. So the, the first step for T-cell activation is recognition of a tumor antigen by the T-cell receptor. This, uh, the, the tumor antigen is presented on MHC molecules. After recognizing their antigen, T-cells then require co-stimulation. Uh, in the absence of co-stimulation, the immune system develops what's called energy, which is um, a tolerance to that antigen. In the presence of appropriate co-stimulation, uh, the T-cell response is activated. Um, both CTLA-4 and PD-1 activation lead to inhibition of T-cell responses, which is why they are therapeutic targets. Um, so that briefly describes the biological principles behind our current treatments. The next most important factor is considering the recurrence risk of a given tumour. Currently, our best method for doing this, as mentioned, is just traditional staging. Um, staging for melanoma follows the most common form of staging referred to as the T and M system. Um, T just refers to the tumor size, which for melanoma is depth of invasion, the Breslow thickness. Um, we use the presence of ulceration to help risk stratify that. Um, N for nodes, M for metastases, and there are multiple subclassifications within that. Uh, so it's a fairly simple system. It's what we use for the majority of cancers but it's, it's very accurate for us in terms of predicting risk of recurrence and also for stratifying uh, metastatic patients. Uh, in terms of further prognostic factors, which help us to predict the likelihood of disease recurrence or overall survival, um, understanding these factors for us helps aid in determining risk of recurrence and the magnitude of benefit of any given treatment. Um, for stage two and three cancers, the factors we think about primarily, in addition to stage, include things like uh, was the tumour ulcerated and actually the specific details of nodal staging. Um, sometimes uh, other things which are helpful can be the subtype of the melanoma, presence of tills, and the mitotic rates, which again all are predictive of recurrence. Um, so just very briefly, immunotherapy was first explored a long time ago with interferon alpha with mixed results. Um, in the last 10 years, though, we've seen really major steps forward in terms of tre treatment, first with stage four and then with earlier stage disease. Um, the, the development of ipilimumab really marks a transition point for melanoma therapies. Um, we now have a range of treatments, uh, treatment options available for metastatic and adjuvant disease. The, the trials for stage two and three melanoma really uh, just follow those four stage four disease. Uh, recurrence risk for stage three varies quite dramatically by subgrouping. So within stage three disease, there are still intermediate and higher risk melanomas. Uh, stage three A, you can see, does quite significantly better than stage three D. This is melanoma specific survival, not risk of recurrence. In terms of treatment, um, well, in terms of treatment, there are two main strategies which, which we can employ. One is immunotherapy, and the second is targeted treatments. For immunotherapy, we've got two two standard PBS listed options, which is nivolumab and pembrolizumab. The trials have more similarities than they do differences, and we would generally think of the treatments as being equivalent. Um, both of which reduce the risk, the relative risk of recurrence by about 40%. So the absolute benefit depends on what their initial staging were, were they stage 3D or 3B. In terms of adverse effects, about 14% of people will get a, a serious adverse effect. So what we would classify as grade three, four adverse effects. And about 10% of patients will have a permanent side effect. The most common things under that uh, banner would be endocrinopathy, things like hypothyroidism. Uh, 
Um, the, the trials themselves were designed to assess the benefit across the entire recruited population. Both trials had about a thousand patients. Um, however, they were large enough that you were actually able to look at the subgroups. And so the benefit was conferred across all, all stages, three B, C and D. Um, and additionally, the benefit was retained for patients who both had a BRAF mutation or did not have a BRAF, what we call wild type. In terms of targeted treatment, so that the targeted treatment that's currently being assessed for stage three disease was debrafenib and trametinib. This is one of those trials which um, well, the lead author was a, an oncologist from Sydney. Um, this trial recruited about 800 patients, all of whom had a BRAF mutation. So these medications only work for patients who have a BRAF mutation. Um, as mentioned, that, that's in about 45 to 50% of patients. Uh, the the five-year follow-up, which has now been completed, showed that this drug or this combination reduced the, the risk of recurrence by between 45 and 50%. So again, a very significant reduction in the risk of recurrence. Um, Dabtram is more challenging to give than immunotherapy whilst patients are on it. About 30% of people have uh, difficult or you know challenging side effects. The side effects are reversible though. And um, as we get more experience with giving these medications, they, they do become better tolerated over time. There are a number of different strategies which we know now that we didn't know about when this trial was initially run. Uh, I guess the other thing to say would be having an adjuvant treatment, it reduces the risk of recurrence, but unfortunately patients still do get recurrence of their melanoma. And the patterns of recurrence do vary a little bit based on what treatment they had. The most common time to recur if you have immune treatment is actually whilst you're on treatment. Whereas for those that are on targeted treatment, it's the first 12 months after completing. Um, yeah, so currently speaking, there's no head-to-head -head trials. There's not, there's not one that is definitively better than the other. And so if a patient comes and sees an oncologist, uh, there's not a right or wrong answer in terms of should this patient get immune treatment or a targeted treatment. Um, it's something that could be, you know, subject to a debate. It's some oncologists will have strong preferences one way or the other, but there's no actual head-to-head -head data. In terms of stage two melanoma, so it represents a bit of a spectrum. Stage two A, has a fairly low risk of recurrence. Um, and the standard practice should be to follow it with surveillance. For stage 2B and 2C melanoma, the risk of recurrence approaches 30%, which is similar to stage three disease. There's no PBS listed treatment at this stage. There have been clinical trials run. And again, with the same two immune treatment agents, nivolumab and pembrolizumab, they've shown a they have this, they lead to the same risk, relative risk reduction in terms of melanoma recurrence, 40%, but the absolute benefit is smaller because the risk of recurrence is smaller. Currently speaking, the follow-up is, is only relatively short. So they've got between two and three years of follow-up. Um, and I guess the challenge is we'll need to wait a number of years, I guess, to see how these trials mature and to know where they really fit in the grand scheme of things. There is a compassionate access pathway, so it's technically available to patients, but certainly shouldn't be routinely offered, can be discussed. Uh, yeah, I think I just got ahead of myself. This, this is just um, showing the actual data for the pembrolizumab trial, which has got bit more follow-up. Um, Risk of side effects is the same, so still a 10% risk of permanent side effects, which needs to be weighed into the equation when you're talking about these treatments for earlier stage disease. I think the other thing to mention is currently there's there are clinical trials running at two sites in Melbourne looking at targeted treatment for patients with high-risk stage 2 disease. And so, again, we would want to know about these patients, even if we're not going to put them on treatment here, they can still have a discussion about going to the Alfred of the Austin to look at one of these trials. And so certain cancers can actually still be cured even if they've got stage four disease. And melanoma really does 
look like it represents one of these cancers. Um, ablating or surgically resecting a, a solitary metastatic site, there are a percentage of patients that don't recur. It's a small percentage, but it's, it's an important group of patients. Within three clinical trials, they have assessed adjuvant treatment for patients who've had their stage four disease totally resected or ablated. And it shows um, significant benefit for those patients to be treated in that fashion. Um, currently speaking, the volumab can be accessed for this purpose. Um, and again, the relative risk reduction is similar. It's 40% relative risk reduction, obviously much higher risk of recurrence, approaching 85% without treatment. Um, it's been evaluated in two further trials where they use combination treatment. One with uh, what we call, uh, I guess, uh, ipi light. So with the second, one of the other immunotherapy drugs called ipilimumab is normally given in combination with nivolumab. We use it for metastatic disease. It's our most effective treatment regimen, which we'll talk about later, but it's got a very high risk of side effects approaching 50%. And so it's a very toxic treatment, but a very effective treatment. It has been assessed in the adjuvant setting overseas. Um, and it, it did show a very significant reduction in the risk of recurrence, more so than single agent treatment, but would only be for very, very selected patients, i.e. people that may have had solitary brain rats resected. Um, and there was a, sorry, and then there was another trial, again, with combination treatment, but with low-dose ipilimumab, which was a, a negative trial that still adds to the evidence that we have about the use of nivolumab for resected stage four disease. Um, in terms of new approaches, so th these are things which are not currently available, but are being assessed. Um, I think the change that we're most likely to see in the future is probably neoadjuvant treatment. So that's that's giving treatment before surgery, not afterwards. Um, there have been clinical trials run, but again, have very short follow-up, which show a reduction in recurrence risk by starting immune treatment before rather than after surgery for stage three disease. Um, it will take a, a period of time, potentially another couple of years before we get a better understanding about what those trials show, but they do look like it's it's going to change the way that we practice melanoma. Um, it may be the case that you get a better immune response to immunotherapy if you, if you have a higher burden of disease when you start the treatment. Um, there are a number of other things which have been evaluated, including other immunotherapy combinations, uh, cancer vaccines and oncolytic biotherapies. Again, they're all things which are currently running in clinical trials. Uh, so in summary, yep, for stage one to two A disease, surveillance from our perspective, surveillance alone, stage three disease and resected stage four disease. Certainly there's a, there's a benefit in terms of reduce, reducing the risk of recurrence by having an adjuvant treatment. Um, and so assessing those patients is beneficial. For high-risk stage two disease, I guess there's clinical equipoise at the moment. We'll need to await further follow-up from the, the clinical trials which have already been completed. Um, it would still be beneficial for us to be able to meet patients who do have high-risk stage two disease to participate in surveillance, but also to discuss these treatments and potentially trials. Um, so I was asked to put up a clinical case. This is actually the, the first photo of, uh, of Amir's. Uh, Mr. TG, 77-year-old man, has fairly standard medical comorbidities, um, presented with a pigmented left chest wall lesion, which had been present for several months, had an excisional biopsy, which showed a, a stage well, a stage 2 PT3 uh, melanoma. Uh, he was referred to Mr. Tadros for re-excision and nodal staging. On his PET, there was no evidence of distant metastatic disease. With re-excision, there was no evidence of residual primary melanoma. However, there was one of two positive sentinel lymph nodes. So he was um, his primary staging was that of stage 3B melanoma. He had molecular testing performed, which showed that he had a BRAF B600E mutation. And so he was referred to us to talk about adjuvant therapy. Um, so for him, there are two standard treatment options. He can either have single agent immunotherapy with either nivolumab or pembrolizumab, or alternatively, he could have the targeted treatment because he harbors a BRAF mutation. At the time, we had a clinical trial running, which was discussed with him looking at a novel immunotherapy combination. 
which has shown activity in the metastatic setting. Um, he, his preference was for single agent uh, nivolumab, so for immunotherapy. And so he commenced that on August and tolerated it well without adverse effects. Um, unfortunately, in January, so what's that? That's yep, five months. Um, he had restaging PET CT, which detected a new nodular soft tissue density uh, to his left anterior lateral chest wall, which was concerning for loco regional recurrence. Um, he was referred for Olshangardic core biopsy, which then did confirm that to be the case. And so the photo you saw before was the re-excision where further seven lymph nodes were resected. And so I guess the question then for us was what, what should we do now? He still has completely resected melanoma. His melanoma has recurred after five-ish months, which is actually the median time for us to see recurrence if someone is going to recur having adjuvant immune treatment. Um, he biologically, this means his cancer, his melanoma is resistant to PD-1 monotherapy. And so continuing that is of no benefit. There's a 0% chance of him responding to it. Um, and so we were able to start him on targeted treatment. Um, at this stage, he hasn't been on for that long. He is having side effects, which is fairly par for the course. He's had fever and rash, which are the two most common side effects to this treatment. So thank you. My slides were uh, really liberal. I emailed these slides to Maggie just uh, about five o'clock. These are these these were labeled as just in case slides, uh, just in case uh, Prashant doesn't come uh, for whatever reason. So apologize if I stutter, if I forget. Just um, um, bear with me for the moment. And our slideshow is not working either. So when we talk about metastatic melanoma, essentially it's an incurable disease. Uh, when we say a stage four disease, it's incurable uh, in principle, but survival has improved significantly over the years, especially in the last decade or so. As mentioned previously, survival was uh, about four or five months, maybe six months with the previously available treatments, including chemotherapy, interleukin, et cetera. But our survival has gone uh, quite significantly, and sometimes people just live for many, many years. And that's, uh, as James mentioned, that's a lot to do with the trials which were done in Australia. George Malone and Chandran Kassar are the key leaders, but there are others uh, as well. Um, so it's quite remarkable seeing the, the growth of uh, the rapidity of uh, development in Malamar cancer treatment. Sorry, are we are just picking up slide now. So when we talk about the uh, metastatic melanoma, again, there are two major groups of, of uh, cancer. One is BRAF mutant. Uh, essentially, when we say BRAF mutant, so these are the uh, intracellular tyrosine kinase pathways which have constitutive activation. And because of that mutation, there's constitutive growth of melanoma. There, you know, essentially what happens, the transduction of the signaling actually continues and goes into the nucleus and the cells continue to, uh, to divide. About nearly about 50% of the melanoma are BRAF mutant and remaining are BRAF wild type. There are less common melanomas uh, mutation as well, like BRAF V600K. Most of the time it's BRAF V600E mutation. Uh, there are uncommon melanomas, uveal melanoma, melanoma, which has all, almost different kind of melanoma, the treatment, uh, has evolved for those melanoma, but the survival has uh, been poor, quite poor actually. So when we talk about uh, the, the, the the treatment of melanoma, there are there's realm of certainty and there's realm of uncertainty as far as the evidence goes. So we know that uh, in unresectable stage three and four patients, we have agents, immunotherapy uh, agents, and there are uh, some uncertain areas where we don't know what is right and wrong. So in in cases of unresectable stage three or four metastatic melanoma, whether we should be using combo versus immunotherapy combo therapy, like doublet immunotherapy, or we should be using single agent uh, immunotherapy, whether you should be using triplet uh, therapy, which means combination of immunotherapy and targeted therapy. We also don't know whether we should be giving adjuvant therapy for high risk stage, early stage cancers, like stage two B and C, or stage three. Um, we don't know, uh, and whether we should give new adjuvants. So those are 
uh, the areas where development is in the flux and in time we'll probably know the answers to those questions. So when we talk about unresectable stage three and four melanoma, we need to think about patient factors and melanoma factors. Uh, first of all, what is the treatment goal? If the patient's performance state is good enough to give adjuvant, or sorry, metastatic treatment with systemic therapy, or if the patient's performance state is too poor, then whether this patient is only for best supportive care. So it's important to know what are the treatment goals. What is the age of the patient? Age is not always the decider. It's mainly the performance status, but sometimes uh, the age may define what the patient preference may be. And certainly with age comes a lot of other difficulties. Uh, so certainly that factor, factors in. What are the underlying conditions, especially the autoimmune diseases? Because when we are giving immunotherapy, there's a huge risk of uh, causing problems. Um, for example, if the patient has um, uh, quite significant immunotherapy, uh, immune-mediated uh, disease like Crohn's disease, for example, or ulcerative colitis. And if we give them immunotherapy, those diseases can flare up quite significantly, putting patients at risk quite significantly. Now, the other thing to consider, what is uh, how far the patient lives, You know whether there's easy access to the healthcare, what prior therapy patient has had so far, and that will also determine what we choose in terms of the metastatic uh, melanoma treatment. Then in terms of the melanoma factors, what is the uh, mutation status? As I mentioned, about 50% of the patient may have BRAF mutation. What is the disease burden? Whether there are more, more than three sites of disease? Because if you have what we call as oligometastatic disease, three or less than three sites of disease, whether those metastatic disease can be resected by surgical intervention. And more co uh, commonly nowadays, we are utilizing surgical expertise to treat those patients uh, in concert with our, our therapy as well. Whether the patient has liver metastasis, whether the patient has CNS metastasis, uh, that's also important. And biomarker, we don't know about the benefit of those biomarker in this uh, uh, right now, but certainly we know we routinely test LDH. We don't know whether there's any benefit of PDL1 or LAG3, which are immune-based biomarkers. Now, this is going back to 2000, when you can see, uh, in terms of the survival benefit, quite dismal survival benefit with the chemotherapy, as you can see. The two arms are running very, very close together, actually. With high, low, high dose interleukin-2, maybe there was some benefit initially, but then the uh, curve flattened out. So, and, and there were a lot of side effects as well. So essentially, there was nothing significant uh, in 2000. And only survival uh, benefit was about 5 to 6% overall survival in five years' time. Whereas if you see now, there's significant increase in the long-term survival with the targeted therapy, the five-year survival is about 35%. With immunotherapy, most recent data, uh, 6.5 years overall survival is about 50%. So about 50% patients are living up to six and a half years, uh, more so than targeted therapy. So those are, those are the things. And especially if you look at these graphs, this is a combination immunotherapy on the top, which is giving you a uh, main uh, benefit in terms of the survival advantage. Now, this is a checkmate trial, which uh, was comparing three arms, uh, epilimumab, uh, which is a CTLA4 antibody, which is acting. Uh, so CTLA4 antibody and uh, anti-PD1 antibody, they are working on the immune axis at different sites. So don't want to go into detail uh, as to the mechanism of action, but essentially what they are doing both of them together is they are enhancing or hyper-stimulating our own immune system and those enhanced immune cells then fight the cancer. So that's the basic, very basic uh, explanation of how immunotherapy works. So if you look at the both combination of immunotherapy here, epilimab and nivolumab, you can see the survival is quite significant on the top here. Whereas if you give only PD1 uh, PD uh, immunotherapy, the survival is a bit less. And if you give CTLA4 antibody, the survival is even less. So the main benefit, significant benefit actually, so 72% patients surviving six and a half years, which is quite remarkable considering what was the survival when the chemotherapy era and high dose interleukin era. So the other thing is to tease out from this trial is that those patients who had the combination immunotherapy, the median time to subsequent therapy after progression hadn't reached. So there was, that had not reached actually. So it's quite remarkable. Whereas those patients who were on nivolumab, about 25%, 25 months. So 
those patients who had immunotherapy, monotherapy, PDL1, their medium time to subsequent therapy was about one year. Whereas uh, in ipilimumab, which, which was ipilimumab was CTLA4 antibody, this, uh, the next line of therapy was within eight months. So again, quite remarkable result. And if you look at these uh, graphs at the bottom, these are the number of the patient, the big dark um, color uh, in each of these uh, uh, pie chart is telling you how much patient, how many patients actually go on went into subsequent therapy. So if you look at this one, uh, nearly more than more than half of them had the subsequent therapy, compared to about forty nine percent in this and about thirty six percent they went to subsequent therapy at that time time point. So in summary, if you have a stage three unresectable disease uh, and a stage four melanoma. Um, there's long-term benefit of combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab. There's longer treatment-free interval with combination, and there are fewer patients with combination immunotherapy which require uh, next line of therapy. But there are actually quite significant uh, side effects as well, uh, and so we'll talk about uh, the side effects more in detail, but essentially immune-mediated side effects were nearly 59% in those patients who had uh, combination of immunotherapy. Most of these uh, side effects are mild to moderate grade, but some of them were severe grade uh, side effects as well. Now, the question is whether we can uh, select some patient uh, treatment based on the melanoma feature or the patient features. That's one thing which, which we always do in clinical setting. If the patient has uh, significant immunological diseases like Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, then we'll probably choose uh, TKIs over immunotherapy uh, and so forth. So patient factors and melanoma factors both matter. Now, looking at the CNS metastasis, if a patient, so benefit of the systemic therapy was seen, uh, actually the, the, that proved uh, correct, even in the case of more, uh, brain metastasis. Brain metastasis is considered poor prognostic feature. So if the patient has brain metastasis, that's quite poor uh, prognosis. But even in those patients, you can see that those patients who presented with symptomatic brain metastasis with this uh, combination of immunotherapy, about 36 patients actually had uh, overall survival at, at 36 months. So three-hour survival uh, with those patients who had symptomatic brain metastasis were about 36%. Whereas those who had no symptoms of the brain metastasis, their overall survival was even better, so 70%. 70, 70 so quite remarkable benefit, again, even in those poor prognostic patients. So this is the takeaway. Uh, in, in another trial, which is COMBI-MB trial, which was a TKI trial, uh, nearly 60% patient of intracranial relapse uh, pre-survival was there in the brain, but the survival benefit in the targeted therapy uh, arm was lower than the, the immunotherapy. So you can see the progression-free survival was only about six months in that case. So essentially, the benefit of immunotherapy does last longer, um, and that's why we prefer to use immunotherapy first up. And this is the trial which I was uh, referring to before, DreamSeq trial. In this trial, uh, patients were assigned combination immunotherapy. They had uh, BRAF mutation positive disease, of course, and they were com combined, they were given immunotherapy first, uh, and then uh, subsequently uh, upon progression. Sorry, I, I had muted this, but I don't know how this is working. Um, and they, they found that uh, if the patient had received the immunotherapy first and subsequently the targeted therapy, they survived, uh, their survival was better actually compared to those who actually had the, the, the TKIs first and then had subsequently immunotherapy. And therefore, we, if you look at this graph, three or more survival rate, if you had IO plus uh, targeted therapy, it was quite significant in this, this, this arm. So, we always prefer uh, the immunotherapy first up. There's another trial, this one, Secombit trial, which again proves the same point. In this trial, quite interesting design. Patients had targeted therapy, then IO at progression, or they had IO at uh, start and then targeted therapy at progression, or they had sandwich treatment, whereby they received targeted therapy for eight weeks, then went into immunotherapy, and then targeted therapy again. And uh, this was the data, which you can see. Uh, the survival rate was much uh, better if you gave uh, IO first, three-year-old survival. But if you look at uh, the uh, next slide, 
those patients who had high LDH, they benefited better with the, with the sandwich, uh, sandwich uh, therapy. So you give T TKI first, then IO, and then, T uh, sorry, you get IO, then TKI, and the TKI again. So that, that was the design. So I'll just go back on that. So sandwich design was targeted therapy first, then IO and targeted. So IO in between or of the targeted therapy. And those patients who had high LDH, their survival was better with the sandwich design. So although this data is not proven, but this could be one consideration in the future if this beards out in the future trial. So, so again, so summarize, the first thing we need to do is if the patient has BRF mutation positive disease, uh, there are two options of giving, uh, of giving them upfront. Clinical trial is always an option and we offer uh, them to everyone. But uh, if the patient is not suitable for clinical trials or the clinical trials are not available, then we have option of giving IO, immuno-oncology treatment or immunotherapy treatment or got targeted therapy. And then even in BRAF mutation positive disease, we give IO first and then TKIs after upon progression. Now, uvil melanoma, I'm just touching on that. We don't see uh, as many cases, very, very few and far in between. So, and most of these cases actually go to uh, bigger centers and rightly so, because we don't have any ophthalmological expertise here as well uh, to treat these patients. So about five to 6% of melanoma, they may have uvil, um, uh, you know, their primary uvil melanoma and 40 to 50% uh, develop metastatic disease, most of the time liver, and median oral survival after metastatic disease is uh, six to 12 months. So far, no oral survival has been benefited with monotherapy, monoimmune therapy, but that has changed now. As you can see in the next slide, sorry, in this slide, there was significant benefit of combined immunotherapy, uh, as you can see, EP Nevo, and median oral survival reached about 19 months. Although there was significant treatment-related adverse effect. Uh, you can see this water called plot, which is quite significant. And you can see uh, quite significant tumor responses uh, upon progressive disease. Uh, a few also had the complete responses. Now, uh, there's a new uh, agent which has now uh, appeared. Now, this has been approved by FDA. We, I don't think we have approval here in Australia. Uh, but this is uh, uh, called uh, Tabinta first, which is basically targeting GP100 um, uh, T cell receptor and anti-CD3 effector uh, at this level, at the transmembrane receptor level. And this was the trial which was, uh, and this is essentially for HLA restrictive, uh, restricted tumors. So HLA uh, of this subtype, which is found in 45% of US and Europeans, but I'm not sure how, what's the data about Australia. Uh, about Australia, uh, we don't have uh, any experience in treating these patients at our center. But what we found found with this uh, with this trial that there was significant survival benefit uh, compared to uh, compared to uh, controls, and this was approved in January of last year by FDA. So essentially, now we have two agents to treat uvil melanoma, about 19 months survival with combination of pilimab and nivolumab, and with uh, Tabenta first about survival of about 20 months. So those are the areas of certainty. We don't know about the uncertain areas, like what should we do, whether we should give uh, immunotherapy combo versus monotherapy, what's wow. the benefit? And this was the trial, Relativity uh, 047 trial, in which they trialed uh, nivolumab and relatimab, which is anti lag 3 another anti-immunotherapy uh, agent. I compared that with, uh, with nivolumab. There was some benefit of the survival, but that did not reach the statistical significance. So we don't know whether uh, there's significant benefit of the combination. Um, I don't think there's a significant, there was one trial which I previously alluded to, but the trial did, was not powered enough to compare the combination of immunotherapy with EP NEVO versus the monotherapy NEVO, although the benefit was seen in both arms, but that was not powered to compare monotherapy versus combination chemotherapy, com combination immunotherapy. This trial actually uh, tries to, is trying to look at that, but again, did not reach the uh, statistical significance. So we don't know this answer. We don't know whether there's benefit of giving combination or not compared to more therapy. So that's area of uncertainty. Um, certainly uh, in patients who are uh, quite old and frail, uh, uh, who are able to not, likely not um, handle combination immune therapy, we offer them uh, monotherapy if, if uh, they are suitable for that. 
This is a trial which was done by Grant MacArthur, uh, Peter McCallum, as you uh, can see now, uh, I think name here, uh, published last year in JCO. Um, this was a triplet uh, trial. So essentially what he tried to do is uh, 514 patient, treatment knife patient, combination uh, of tar uh, targeted therapy with the immune therapy. And what they found that initially there was a significant benefit of the HR with, of about 0.78. Uh, that gives you about uh, nearly 22% benefit in terms of oral survival. But second analysis did not show any significant benefit. So although it was approved by FDA, uh, it did not reach statistical significance. So right now, we don't have the confirmatory data whether triplet therapy will, bet, will be better or not. Uh, the question is whether we should be using triplet therapy with CNS metastasis or not. Uh, certainly, there is higher oral response rate uh, and duration response with, uh, uh, with triplet therapy. Uh, but again, this, this question is not confirmatory, confirm, um, confirmatory uh, sorry, uh, answered yet. So confirmed uh, trials will tell us whether or not uh, this is something which we should be using, using in some of the patients. So this, this is my summary slide for advanced melanoma. There are certain areas, certainly if the patient has uh, is eligible uh, uh, clinically and there are no red flags as far as the immunotherapy treatment is concerned, we would all, always consider uh, combination immunotherapy to monotherapy uh, and durable treatment that, and then the, then the targeted therapy. Um, if you have seen as metastasis, clearly there was benefit with the, uh, uh, with EP Nevo. Uh, always use targeted therapy after immune checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, and with metastatic uvil melanoma, the survival has improved with two agents, which we talked about, uh, Tabenta first and EP Nevo combination. There are some uncertain areas whether uh, we should be using this combination of uh, nivolumab and relactimab versus monotherapy, PDLM, PD1. Uh, certainly, relactimab and nivolumab has uh, slightly less toxicity compared to EP and nevo. Whether we should be using triplet therapy for patient with CNS metastasis, and whether we should be using sandwich therapy for those patients who have higher LDH. So those are the uncertain areas. Uh, I think I won't go into at high risk adjuvant because adjuvant has already been covered by James. So I'll probably hand it over to the next speaker, which is Sue. All right, we're back on, folks. Um, let me introduce you to uh, Sue Bart, who's an oncology nurse practitioner at Grand Institute. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, immunotherapy toxicities. So um, for patients that you know are uh, put on treatment that James and Sherard have talked about and, and how we manage these patients if they become unwell or get side effects from immunotherapy. The next slide. Oh, right, okay, sorry. Radio. <laughs> um, so uh, I guess traditionally when we gave chemotherapy, we knew that um, chemo killed healthy cells as well as cancer cells. Um, but with cancer immunotherapy, it actually selectively just kills um, cancer cells. So traditionally, we, you know, when people are on chemotherapy, we are looking at their white cell count, hemoglobin, platelets. Um, but with immunotherapy, these um, blood results don't change because it's not actually killing the immune system as such. Um, immunotherapy has absolutely revolutionised the approach to treatment for a variety of cancers, in particular melanoma, um, and it's had a greatest impact, as um, James and Sherrod's already talked about. Um, but we also know with these new therapies, um, we're trying to manage uh, side effects that we haven't seen, and I think we're becoming better at understanding them and managing them, but it's been a huge steep learning curve for us all in oncology. Next slide. So um, immuno-oncology therapies um, switch on the immune system um, to attack um, cells along with tumour cells. Um, Immune-related adverse reactions can be severe or life-threatening and can either occur during or after treatment um, has discontinued and can affect any organ in the system. Um, and it's not limited to skin, um, the GI tract, endocrine, hepatic, neurologic, pulmonary, renal, ocular, and cardiovascular. Next slide. 
So when we look at um, a patient who we're about to start immunotherapy for um, in an ambulatory setting, uh, we're looking at um, educating the patient really well so, so that they know what to look out for and to know when to seek help. Um, and also when they're likely to start getting um, side effects and symptoms from this treatment. So it usually occurs three months after they start in comparison to chemotherapy where they could go home and within hours start to feel unwell from the treatment. Um, if we're not sure if it's related to the treatment, we often will do a um, tissue biopsy, particular for um, toxicities that we would grade a three or four. Um, before starting treatment, we're always looking at the patient and assessing their susceptibility to immune-related adverse events. So as um, James and Sherrod has already indicated, if they've got a previous autoimmune um, disease, then, you know, they're somebody that would be considered high risk and um, is there more risk than benefit for them to start an immune-related um, treatment? <clears throat> Next slide. So the key principles of um, immune-related management is that um, we know that multi-organ systems and tissues can be affected by the treatment and it can occur during and um, after they finish treatment um, months after. Some of the side effects um, often overlap um, and now as we're getting um, more aware of the uh, impact of um, treatments, particularly targeted treatments, not only are patients having immunotherapy, but we're also giving chemotherapy as well. So it's now we're having to sit back and go what's related to the chemotherapy and what's related to the immunotherapy. So it's um, making our job, you know, much more complex. Obviously, the earlier that we identify that these patients are having a treatment-related um, adverse event from their immunotherapy means that we're getting onto their side effects more um, earlier. And hopefully it means that um, once we've gone on top of their treatment um, side effects that they can restart their treatment um, and obviously have a better outcome for their cancer diagnosis. Next slide. <clears throat> so I just thought I'd go through um, some of the side effects that we often see at Grampians Health and potentially you may also see um, patients present uh, with to your clinic um, with these side effects as well. So. We know that diarrhea and colitis is very common. Um, so when we're assessing a patient, um, whether they're calling us through the symptom and urgent review clinic or they're presenting to clinic or however they're coming in contact with their healthcare team, we want to know if um, while they might have diarrhea, if it's you know more than four above what their normal is. Um, if they've got any PR bleeding or mucus, um, if they've got any, any cramping abdominal pain. Um, and it can actually affect any part of their intestinal tract. Um, so if you have a patient um, attend your clinic that has diarrhea and you know they're on immunotherapy, this is something that we would um, want you to call um, the Symptom and Urgent Review Clinic at Grampians Health about um, because severe colitis can be life-threatening um, for a range of reasons, including sepsis, perforation or dehydration. Um, and uh, we need to observe the patient um, and watch them very closely. And we also need to make sure that there's not any other disease related um, side effects or symptoms going on that we need to rule out that actually may not be immune related at all. Next slide. Um, so hepatic abnormalities. So we would see elevation in their um, LFT results. Um, often they have also an elevation in their bilirubin. Um, hopefully we don't ever see them at a point where they've got um, jaundice, so yellow skin or eyes. Um, they may have pain on the right side of their stomach area and they also could be quite tired. Um, if a patient does present with hepatitis, it can be more complicated um, as an LFT derangement could also be related to um, disease progression um, it could be medications. They could also be on chemotherapy that's causing their LFTs to be, um, you know, often not normal. Um, or it could be a, not related to their chemotherapy and their cancer diagnosis at all. And it could be that they've got gallstones. Um, so if there's always a clinical uncertainty um, where we're not sure what's going on, we may request a liver biopsy 
Um, and severe hepatitis also needs to be observed and monitored very closely. Next slide. So with um, skin um, signs and symptoms, um, patients can come out with a rash and it can be, you know, inflammation of the skin, pruritus, erythema, um, or ulcers, um, blisters and peeling. Um, an itch and a rash is particularly common and really troublesome for patients. So sometimes they may not have a rash at all, but they're just really itchy um, and it's really a burden on their day-to-day -day life, particularly if they're, you know, trying to work and um, raise children or look after elderly parents, whatever is going on for them. Um, so it can be very uncomfortable. And while we have treatments, sometimes it really doesn't uh, manage it well. Um, so if uh, there is a severe rash, so grade three or worse, um, we would often involve um, the dermatology team to help guide management on what we do um, moving forward. Next slide. So the um, endocrine immune related adverse events are typically irreversible and often the patient will need lifelong treatment. Um, and so we get concerned if patients ring and they've suddenly got increased fatigue, um, they've got headaches, abdominal pain, they've got hypertension, um, excessive thirst, visual disturbances, um, you know, it can be very broad. Um, thyroiditis would typically, typically be observed if the patient is asymptomatic um, and uh, treatment initiated if patients um, do become have a hypo, hypothyroidism. Um, any other endocrinopathies typically involve initial review from an endocrinologist um, for things like type 1 diabetes, hypocortisolism, um, and um, anything else that we're quite concerned about. Um, severe endocrinopathies also include adrenal insufficiency um, and uh, diabetes mellitus if there's a DKA um, that occurs. Next slide. So renal signs and symptoms, um, they're quite uncommon. Um, if a patient does present that's on immunotherapy that has an AKI, um, we often will look at if there's something else that's causing this, such as dehydration from vomiting or poor oral intake, um, a toxicity from another chemothera um, chemotherapy, such as a platinum, if they're having joint chemo immunotherapy, or it could be some other supportive medications that they're on, or it could actually be an obstructive cause. Um, <clears throat> if a normal process, if we're concerned about the patient, is um, getting the uh, nephrology team in, involved and seeing the patient and working together to manage the symptoms. Um, if we're not sure, we often may need a biopsy to confirm what's going on for the patient. Um, and often it will be an immune suppression um, regime that the patient will go on that will be monitored very closely between both oncology and the renal team. Um, severe nephritis and renal, renal dysfunction um, is observed and um, any other related um, etiology should be ruled out. Next slide. So pneumonitis, um, we always have a bit of an alarm bell if patients are on immunotherapy and they suddenly ring and say they've got new onset of shortness of breath, or if um, a week ago they could walk three kilometres and they can still walk three kilometres, but they've got to stop several times and sit down, um, that's a real red flag for us. So any breathing difficulties or cough, um, if we're concerned, we'll send them off for a CT or a CTPA, um, and uh, often that might come back with glass ground changes or patchy infiltrates. Um, and often hypoxia um, can be, you know, a presentation as well, um, which I've seen in my role um, at Brick. Um, so it can be a bit of a diagnostic dilemma because there's actually no real test to confirm whether it's definitely immune related or could be something else, um, but it is life threatening. And we've looked after quite a few patients in my previous role um, in CERC that patients were really quite unwell when they presented with SATs of 75% on room air. Um, and uh, 
we need to monitor these patients really closely. Um, often, depending on the grade of the um, pneumonitis, we may not ever re-challenge immunotherapy just because it's um, quite um, a high risk for the patient if we restart um, the immunotherapy again. Next slide. So neurotoxicity, um, we don't, um, thankfully they're rare, so we don't see them often. But um, we, you know, they are still a risk and um, it can still happen to patients. Um, these um, side effects um, such as encephalitis, um, autoimmune uh, neuropathy um, were found more so in clinical trials than what we see generally in the day-to-day -day treatment of patients. Next slide. Um, and the other rare... Um, Side effects and toxicity that we see can be Guillain-Barre, um, neutropenia, um, alopecia, and, um, and I guess for anyone that's looking after somebody who you know is on an immunotherapy, you need to um, know that any part of the body can be affected um, at any time during their treatment. And even if they're finished treatment and they're a few months after their last cycle, if um, they're starting to get new symptoms or side effects, it actually could still be related to their immunotherapy. <clears throat> so I guess um, we're probably about 11 years into when immunotherapy started to initially started in clinical trials for melanoma. And now there's pretty much not um, a patient population with a cancer diagnosis that immunotherapy is not considered part of their treatment plan. So with all these years and knowledge, we know that um, it's not just the oncology team that need to manage these patients if they become unwell. Um, we need to also link the patient in with other teams, such as the endocrinologist, um, you know, neuro, um, whatever is going on for the patient, and need to work together to really um, manage the patient and their symptoms, get them better in the hope that, you know, they can be re-challenged with their treatment um, for you know, better outcomes. Next slide. <clears throat> so as we're getting more and more knowledgeable about what happens for patients on treatment and how we can better manage um, their side effects, there's also um, new drugs coming out as well for um, ways in we can manage patients and their side effects and hopefully get them better um, to not only re-challenge their uh, treatment, but also for life afterwards. Um, because often, you know, patients are having immunotherapy for a curative intent and we want them to finish their treatment and go back to life and have a really good quality of life. So I'll just talk um, about some patients that we've seen um, at Grampians Health. So <clears throat> I'll just, if anyone doesn't know what CERC is, um, it's a clinic uh, that's run at uh, the day oncology unit on level one at Brick. It's been running now for three years and it's a Monday to Friday ED clinic for oncology patients. So we're, uh, it was set up in the hope to keep patients out of ED if we possibly could. Um, and so it's a nurse-led clinic with um, very close medical oncology support for patients who've got symptoms or side effects from their treatment or maybe actually unwell from their cancer diagnosis. So um, this gentleman um, called Cirque, um, he'd been feeling really symptomatic with fatigue, confusion. Um, he had three days of blurred vision, polydipsia and polyuria. He'd actually completed uh, ipilimumab and nivolumab for four cycles and then was having maintenance nivolumab. Um, and his past history was nothing unremarkable and he was on... Um, general medications to treat his um, medical history. Um, he uh, had, after he called CERC and he was um, basically the day before he presented to his local um, ED centre um, with a high blood sugar of um, 39.2, but he didn't have a history of type 1 or type 2 diabetes. Um, and he they stabilised um, his diabetes or blood sugars, and he went home. And so um, I think he'd taken his blood sugar again at home and it was reading high, so he was advised to come into 
Grand Pins Health Ballarat ED and the CERC team liaised with the ED staff. So when that patient presented, he went straight through and um, the ED staff had record of what had happened the day before his local ED unit. Um, so that his other blood results, um, his sodium was low and um, obviously ketones were 0.6 and his pH was 7.2. So um, he was diagnosed with hypoglycemia, which was secondary to his immunotherapy. Um, he was admitted for uh, quite a few days. He was reviewed by um, the endo team, the diabetes nurse, and he was put on a diabetes management plan. Um, and he did recommence his immunotherapy, but it was delayed for a month um, until he became a bit more stable and got his blood sugars under control. Next slide. Um, so this is uh, a patient who presented for his routine clinic review pre his treatment. So the plan was he was having his immunotherapy after he'd seen the doctors, um, but he um, had had worsening shortness of breath, no chest pain. Um, he'd had some phlegm that he was bringing up, but wasn't sure if it was any particular color. And he also had increased work of breathing the unbelievable thing about him when I eventually uh, met him in Cirque was he had to walk on crutches because he had um, bony mets and he would pretty much walked from one side of the hospital to the other and I don't actually know how he did it, but he did. Um, the day he came to um, the hospital, he was due for a cycle seven of Pembro um, and so uh, he came to Cirque for uh, urgent CTPA but when um, I saw him put his um, oxygen on, couldn't believe it was 74% on room air. So he'd been functioning very well on that um, oxygen level. Um, and the CTPA showed uh, grass uh, ground glass changes, um, suggestive of immune-related pneumonitis. And he also had a left pleural effusion. So he was admitted to hospital, um, much to his dismay, for over a week and he was given IV methylpred um, for five days and then he was put on oral steroids um, for a long-term weaning dose, which was constantly reviewed by the oncology team. He was weaned off his O2 prior to discharge um, and he was seen in clinic after discharge um, in monitoring his steroid um, weaning doses, but it was considered too much of a risk for him to have any um, further immunotherapy. Um, and there was consideration of second line systemic anti-cancer therapy. And I guess in this situation, because he'd already had pneumonitis, um, it was a significant risk for more hospitalis hospitalisation for him and potential death if we had continued um, giving him immunotherapy. Next slide. So um, patient scenario number three. So this is a lovely lady who lived about an hour and a half away from Ballarat with very minimal medical support close by. Um, so she'd started ipilimumab and nivolumab eight days prior for um, melanoma and she'd been educated very well about what to look out for. Um, she'd been called the day before, things were great, but then she rang the next morning and she had a whole full body rash from head to toe. Um, so she came, she got brought down to Ballarat. She was started on prednisolone, loratadine and given hydrocortisone cream to manage her rash. Because she lived so remotely with, um, you know, I think two days a week GP service, no urgent care or ED close by. Um, Cirque was kept in very close um, contact with his patient and um, we were getting her down weekly and then photos sent through to us to manage her um, rash. And so she was seen by medical oncology three weeks later. She still had um, a rash of about 36% of her body surface area. So her prednisolone was increased to 25 milligrams for three days. And then it was weaned down slowly from tw to 12.5 and then 10 milligrams daily, still including the loratadine and the hydrocortisone cream. So treatment was um, delayed through all of this. Um, and then she was seen in a week later. Again, the rash unfortunately had worsened. 
Um, and so it was now 72% of her body surface area. Um, so it was now graded as a grade three rash. Um, so eventually, after con constant management over several weeks, a punch biopsy was done in circ of the site. Um, and then there was, again, follow-up weekly circ reviews and a referral to the Royal Melbourne Dermatology Clinic. Um, she was, uh, after a long management and eventually off um, steroids, she, we were able to recommence her nivolumab. Um, but uh, when she had her next lot of staging scans, it showed a mixed response. And her IO was ceased not because of her melanoma diagnosis, but unfortunately she had had a stroke. And so um, that became a priority. But I guess in the early days, we would have felt very anxious about managing patients so far away from a hospital um, because of the risk of um, immune-related side effects. So by having you know, a, a team of um, allied health nursing and medical staff, we're able to you know, offer these treatments now to patients who live um, in rural areas. So I don't know if everyone's familiar with EverQ, but um, I know this is my Bible. So if anyone rings about symptoms or toxicities and I know they're on immunotherapy, I go straight to EverQ. And it's actually an eight-page um, management plan of all the immune-related toxicities that patients can have while they're on this treatment, um, how we would grade them and what the management would look like. So I would encourage everyone to keep that close by. Next slide. Um, how we treat toxicities, there's lots of guidelines that um, we look at regularly. So we've got ESMO, um, the Society of Immune Immunotherapy um, Guidelines, ASCO and the NCCN. And they're always being updated and constantly reviewed. Next slide. So these are just some of the resources that um, are available for not only health professionals but patients um, on um, you know, immunotherapy and what to look out for. So um, the immunotherapy, what to expect, they're actually patient resources that got put together by Peter Mac um, with support from, I think it was MSD, and um, it's health professionals but also patients that have been on immunotherapy and I think it's always good for patients to be educated about what to look out for because if they don't know what's normal, they're not going to contact their medical team for advice and support. <clears throat> Next slide. And then this is um, just a bit of a plug for our symptom and urgent review clinic. So um, I think since the three years that it's been uh, in operation, we've uh, had over 5,000 contacts and um, saved a lot of ED admissions. Um, so I would encourage um, any GP who has a patient on systemic treatment and unsure what's normal or if they should be concerned that they can um, call the CERT clinics. It's Monday to Friday, 8.30 to 4. Um, and patients can actually come in and be reviewed by their um, medical oncology team. Next slide, and that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Appreciate it. Great presentation. Uh, next, we welcome um, Maggie Zack, uh, who will be our last presenter this evening. So, over to you, Maggie. Tell everybody who you are. And if you can please say next slide, I can push the button. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm Maggie. I'm one of the uh, clinical trial coordinators at uh, Grampians House. Um, Thanks everyone coming tonight and thank you all the online participants. Next slide. So in my talk today, I will briefly um, talk about the landscape of clinical trials in melanoma treatment. And I'll also want to highlight some um, important benefits and risks of uh, associated with um, clinical trials. And also I'd like to discuss what general practitioners can do to support our clinical trial patient um, in the community. Um, in the end, I would like to introduce our clinical trial team at Grampings House, and I'll talk about how to make referrals to us. Um, 
So immunotherapy and targeted therapy have been the uh, two major um, areas of advancement in melanoma treatment, um, as well as a better understanding of the genetics and biology um, of the disease. So here are some significant achievements. Um, so with immunotherapy, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors used for um, advanced melanoma includes um, epilimumab and pembrolizumab and nivolumab. And they have shown significant improved survival rate for patients with um, advanced melanoma. Um, and also uh, with the combination therapy, so um, for example, the uh, nivolumab and uh, uh, ipilimumab, they has, recent data has shown uh, they actually can be more effective than uh, just uh, using a uh, single drug agent. Uh, it can be uh, increase uh, the uh, survival rate to 26%. That's why it has been uh, used as a new standard treatment approach for advanced melanoma. And targeted therapy is for patients with specific uh, gene mutation, uh, like BRA and MAC mutations. And the most common ones are um, bemurafinib, dabrafinib, and uh, tramitinib. Um, both immunotherapy and targeted therapy have been tested in adjuvant setting, and Dr. Sherard and James has discussed a lot uh, previously. So with the rapid changing um, um, data in clinical trials, um, so these two therapies, um, can delay and prevent uh, melanoma recurrence. Next slide. And also want to briefly talk about uh, the oncolytic virus therapy. So it is a modified herpes virus and its target um, to killing the cancer cells directly and also stimulate uh, immune response against them. Um, so the treatment is injected directly into tumors that are cutaneously or subcutaneously. And we also have melanoma vaccines. It works to prevent the recurrence of cancer after surgery in patients with high risk melanoma. Um, so I'd like to talk about the uh, EVX02. This is one of the melanoma vaccine study we had um, on our site. So it's an adjuvant immunotherapy with a personalized um, EVX02 vaccine uh, treated with nivolumab. So it targets at patients who have had a complete reception of stage three and stage four melanoma and patients uh, with high risk of uh, recurrence. Um, so we had a one patient on this study, and he actually has achieved a complete remission. Um, also, adoptive cell therapy. So tumor infiltrating inf uh, lymphocyte therapy and CAR T cell therapy are both in study in um, for melanoma treatment. So it involves altering patients' immune cells to target um, melanoma cells. Uh, malignant melanoma cells. Next slide. So, um, with the potential benefits, the patient would have opportunities to be given the new interventions that may be better for the um, conditions and it may have less side effects. Um, compared to what they may receive in standard care. And trials may offer participant um, access to the newest interventions before they may to be available for the public, um, general public. Um, they also have the opportunities to play an active role in their own health care and to gain a greater understanding of their disease and condition. And also they would have risk uh, have ongoing support and care from uh, well-trained uh, research staff and throughout their whole treatment, they will be closely monitored 
even if patients are randomized to standard care uh, arm, they would have um, close monitoring by other um, clinical research staff. Next slide. So potential risk, because participating in clinical trials um, involves the testing of new medications, treatment, and procedures. So it may have unknown side effects. Um, so, and our treatment under investigations, uh, they may not work in for those patients. They may not be as effective as current uh, standard of treatment. So this can be particularly challenging for patients if they have um, serious and life-threatening illness. Um, and also for some trials, they would include a control group that receives placebo instead of the active treatment. So being in um, placebo group means they may not be uh, potentially receiving the beneficial treatment. Um, time commitment. So participation in clinical trials often requires more time and uh, commitment um, for the hospital visit, which means they could have more um, frequent uh, hospital appointment, hospital stays and treatment um, bookings, um, and with complex dosage requirements as well. Um, and it always comes with emotional and psychological um, challenge. It can be very stressful being um, part of the study because of the uncertainty with the treatment effectiveness, uh, side effect, and just the general strains of being part of the study. Next slide. Um, so what general practitioners can do in a community? Um, so GPs can play several critical roles in clinical trials, depending on the specific requirement of the trial. Um, so first of all, with patient recruitment, um, because general, practice, general practitioners is the primary point of contact uh, for the potential research participants. So they are actually uh, can be very helpful uh, to identify patient who might be meet the eligibility criteria. Um, and also GPs can uh, monitor patient's health status throughout the treatment, providing regular um, updates to the research team. Um, some patients may be involved in long-term follow-up and GPs play a vital role in detecting those delayed side effects and uh, benefit uh, and the uh, or the benefits of ongoing monitoring. Um, with communication, so GPs usually uh, act as a bridge uh, between the trial team and the patient, um, facilitating the communications, um, uh, forwarding the medical records between clinical research team and the patient. Involving community involvement. So general practitioners can also help with increased involvement of broader community in research by participating in clinical trials. Um, they may enhance the relevance of research to everyday general practitioner and helps to ensure that research outcomes are applicable and beneficial to a wider range of patients. Next slide. So here's the list of all the melanoma studies we um, had in uh, Gramping's house. And we're currently still open to recruitment to Checkmate 002 and the Hoyer study. Um, so Checkmate 002 is a second line um, treatment for metastatic unresectable melanoma. And the Hoyer study is the first line um, treatment for metastatic melanoma. And if you are interested uh, for more details about the eligibility criteria, and I have included our referrals details in my last slide. Next slide, please. So this is our clinical trial team. Um, 
were established actually in 2004, and we're currently running more than 100 studies from phase one to phase four. And we have experienced um, GCP certif uh, certified staff. We have 20 principal investigators and 10 study coordinators with one 12 uh, assistant. And we have also have two PhD uh, interns. Um, they joined us through the VCCC skilled clinical trial internship program. Um, so on site, we have a clinical trial pharmacy with secure controlled access and the storage of investigational products. Um, and we we'll also have documented um, SOP. Next slide, please. So this is our um, lab room and our uh, monitoring uh, room, and this is our office. And just want to show you guys our group photo from our team. So um, refer a patient to a clinical trials, um, we usually would require a referral letter with medical history, previous cancer diagnosis, treatment, and past and current medications. And with the most recent imaging and blood test results, uh, history results, and molecular pathology results, if performed. Um, so we, uh, sorry. So this is our clinical trial emails um, and welcome to send us any inquiries um, about studies. And also I have got our manager's contact here. Um, Carmel, she's already uh, also coming today and also Dr. Sherard. Thank you. Thanks, Maddie, uh, Maggie, uh, and thanks everybody that's uh, online uh, as well with us today. I'm just going to stop sharing the slide deck here for a minute. Um, we, good Lord, I've muted every other chat in my um, in the activity. Uh, thank you for joining us here today. Uh, we do uh, going to have a few words from Steve Medwell here. I just want to make a shout out to those that are online uh, and those in the room that we'll have time for questions afterwards, uh, just with a one minute for you, Steve. We're, we're a little bit over time, but thank you for joining us. And if you can stand or sit near the computer, um, that'll allow everybody to see you. Um, yeah, so Sherrod asked me to say a few words just to finish up tonight. Um, I'd like to thank um, the team who organised the evening. It's been a terrific evening. Thanks, Maggie, for the hard work that you put into tonight. Um, terrific um, group of speakers um, tonight on our melanoma refresher. Uh, one of the things I think that must be really satisfying for our GPs is when they when they find something and they send something through that ends up getting an outcome and a response that's a good one for the patient and, and also a good one for you. So we really want to keep seeing those referrals coming through the clinical trials teams and the research teams at, at, at Grampians Health. Um, we've got a growing team as Sherard mentioned, we're looking to continue to grow our MDMs across the region. We do 160, 166 MDMs a year. We're looking to build on what we currently do, continue to have expert, expert supports and care um, to our patients. We are committed to treating patients closer to home. When I started my cancer career 35 years ago, low volume cancers, they only had really one or two places to go. It's very very evident now that the patients can have treatment closer to home. I think that's really important. Um, the other thing that's really important that, that perhaps we didn't see with the clinical trials team is I think Carmel, six or seven years ago, there might have been 15 or 20 trials that we had, got over 100 trials that we're, we're recruiting to. So um, that's, a, I think, a pretty big testament to the work that the team's done there in, in growing clinical trials in Ballarat and the region. Thanks so much for your attendance tonight. And um, yeah, go well. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just uh, remind everybody that uh, there's an evaluation survey for this for the group that for the team uh, that are in the room. I'll put it up on the uh, screen shortly. Just wanted to take an opportunity for if anybody wanted to ask any of our speakers a question. And if you do have questions, please lift your hand in the room. I don't think there's any online, and Jade will um, tell me if there is. Uh, otherwise. Um, to the room, is there anybody have any questions and could you please come and give your answers to the computer? 
and nothing the, online at the moment, Naomi. Uh, so when you talk about this uh, screening, 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 you know, schools, well, there has been a validation of those apps in in class seven or more. There's any benefit for screening screening, for example, the age of the school. Think of this about it. I'll just get James to come up here so we can answer the question. So uh, Dr. Sharma's asked about the, the apps uh, and uh, I get the whole question right about, uh, I'll get James to repeat the question. Yeah, and go ahead. yeah I think the, um, the, uh, the question was, you know, has there been any um, survival um, um, benefit from, you know, any of the interventions that we do? Um, I don't know of any studies about survival intervention. Um, melanoma is tricky, as you probably know, because um, especially melanoma in situ, we're not sure how many of those actually, you know, um, would go on and cause um, trouble. Certainly there's evidence for total body photography and serial digital monitoring, picking up lesions that don't have any clues um, to melanoma, and some of those are invasive melanomas. Um, I haven't actually seen any studies showing a survival benefit from those, but um, I guess if you're picking them up it's, and they're invasive, that has to be good. But um, I don't know of any survival adventures. And the um, it was relatively new that uh, one about the um, um, Meta Optima who run Derm Engine applying for a TGA approval for um, their AI to help GPs with their um, thing. Because I mean, it's quite a time investment to learn demoscopy, and you know, it takes years to become good at, really good at it. And so, if you've got something that can help you, so they, they, I haven't, said that. we were just at the conference and they mentioned they'd applied to the TGA for it. So, I imagine if the TGA um, is going to accept it, they would have to have some reasonably compelling evidence. But I, I didn't actually get to see that at the time. But um, certainly, like, there's plenty of um, articles um, showing the effectiveness of um, um, serial monitoring. Um, not so much evidence for long term monitoring of every need, um, you know, every pigmented lesion, but, um, you know, selected lesions that, you know, perhaps, you know, a bit of an outlier that um, you're concerned about, but don't meet the criteria for melanoma. There's, there's evidence you, you certainly can pick up more melanomas uh, with those. Um, and uh, I mean, there is evidence for total body, but not survival benefit that I know of. Yeah. yeah. So I guess that's not much benefit of doing population screening, maybe yeah. screening for the highest portions. Yeah. Well, uh, in the guidelines, you know, the, Australia doesn't do. You know, population screening, but they do the guidelines. I think it was level C for high risk patients. So, you know, the ones we we um, see ten times risk for the first couple of years after your um, initial melanoma diagnosis. So, um, patients who've um, you know had a previous melanoma, probably ongoing four or five times risk. Um, the people with more than hundred nevi are probably the next most common, and then um, um, you know, then family history and things. But the combinations of those mix of factors are often high risk too. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Dr. Thank you. We we do have a question um, online. Thanks to Joe. Is there another way to access evaluation <laughs> other than QR code for those of us who wish to complete on the desktop, not the phone? Um, no worries, Joe. Uh, Jade will uh, put that in chat for you. That's um, probably the easiest answer that uh, question that we'll ask today. Is there any? Yes. Oh. That was a terrible project. <laughs> don't, don't desert you. Don't desert you to get a photo. No worries. Thank you. Wonderful. We're going to have a photo in the room. Yes, yes. but I mentioned that maybe for some information about um, from the Cancer Council for patients about what the trials, the benefits and the risks, and also um, the trials that were actually running the present in the in the oncology unit. And Thank you. Um, and just for those online, we were referring to the resources that have been, have been shared with you today, and particular uh, focus on the uh, clinical trials that are open and looking for participants. Yes. Um, um, at the moment, we have several nodes which are reducing the to just surgical. Um, plastic seems to have a very long way for a lot of things. So, um, is it planned? Yeah, yeah. Um, is it planned that you know, people who need like 
um, Amir, I'll get you to come up here to answer. Plastic reconstruction and central wind so, um, Is that going to be a service debate often in a timely manner, or is that Over here. not possible? The, with the, the, uh, just for the for the group yeah. that are online still um yeah you can, no, no, that's fine um for the group that are online the question is about referrals to grampians health's uh plastic unit they usually the um the referral is for uh oncology or surgically for it but not necessarily plastic because that's new for us so i'll let you answer yeah so at the moment we're going through the vetting process so i'm meeting with the people who are responsible for the gp liaison team because there's no way to vet very urgent semi-urgent delayed skin cancers like we do in geelong so we're trying to get a similar type of vetting to geelong the aim is to do all central node biopsies as we do elsewhere uh, because we cover head and neck axilla groin so we cover all the Aspects, but also do all the dissections at the next sections, auxiliary section, groin section. So it makes more sense to have a, a service for people that can deal with just the central node as well as all the sections for each body part. Um, so hopefully, in the next two weeks, I'm meeting them next Monday, and hopefully, within the next two weeks, we'll have a much more efficient sort of referral pathway for melanomas, for um, high grade SCCs, and then for BCCs, unless you think it needs more urgent referral but the vetting system doesn't doesn't allow for that now thank you thank you um, i'm just acknowledging time for today i think we might end the session here and obviously there's for those that are here in person there's some networking time for you uh, available uh, i'd like to uh, thank everybody that's on online and appreciate the feedback that you're providing uh, to us on the event. Um, we don't run a lot of hybrid events, so thank you for bearing with us with the uh, technical difficulties on this occasion. Uh, I appreciate you coming to this event um, and looking forward to seeing everybody at future occasions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.